before seen gourmet concept shaped over millions of years featuring 100% natural ingredients and four Michelin starred chefs so put on your best clothes shine your shoes and get ready because you're going to Sweden the biggest gourmet restaurant in the world. That's right, we have turned our whole country into a restaurant. You see, here in Sweden, fine dining is just around the corner, in our nature. And everyone is invited. Together with our star chefs, we have composed a do-it-yourself menu from ingredients that you can forage in our forests fields and lakes. To make it easier for you to experience what our nature has to offer, we have placed tables and cooking kits in a few pretty nice spots around the country. Reserve your seat at visitsweden.com. If it's fully booked, don't worry. There's another 100 million acres of fine do-it-yourself dining available for you. Always close, always open. Simple, healthy, and delicious. Welcome to Sweden, the edible country. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have uh, more than 120 million monthly active users and uh, more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything, so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Passion, he created Minecraft, and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies. Uh, which was amazing and more or less unheard of in the, like the indie game scene. We believed that we had peaked, but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. When I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we... 
Hi, and welcome to uh, game seven of this special challenge match between David Howell and uh, Nils Grandelius. Uh, they're playing in the heart of London uh, at the Swedish Embassy. And David Howell is leading the match uh, three and a half uh, to two and a half after many exciting and intense games. And uh, today, I'm really happy. I'm joined by Grandmaster Mikhailo uh, Oleksienko. And uh, Hello, everyone. please let us know what is going on now in this uh, position, uh, Mikhailo. Uh, well, it's, it's an Italian game. And uh, Black um, uh, David decided to, to go with the Bishop C5 line. Uh, there is knight f6 move here, and um, but you have to be ready for knight g5, and uh, but you can go bishop c5. The only uh, there are two downsides to this move. Other one, you can have Evans gambit, but it's not popular on on high level, and um, and there's this c3 uh, followed by early d4. Uh, so these are the basically two prices to pay when you play bishop c5 instead of knight f6. But if you choose knight f6, and you have to, uh, yeah, there are lots of complications after after this line. And uh, Wesley saw me the course about this, so uh, not everybody is ready to to go for it. <laughs> so uh, and why would you if you get relatively calm positions after bishop c5? And after castle knight f6, just development, development, development. Recently, I've seen a game there was a move rookie one that I honestly never seen before, and it looked weird to me. But the idea is, well, of course. To defend the pawn, but then white still goes c3 and d4 in one sitting, right? Because now, if you as the game went with d3, now even if you plan c3 d4, white loses one tempo, right? And that's a big deal. If you lose one tempo, you're suddenly not white, but black, you have black pieces. Like not always, but you can look at uh, at this uh, that way. And so, uh, but d3 is a solid move, and so the idea of this move, one of the ideas, is very often white goes special g5 trying to <clears throat> pin this knight. Uh, this is, by the way, how Nils Grandilius uh, beat me in Bundesliga last year. Uh, we also had, uh, but uh, we had Rui Lopez with, uh, but the, the pawn structure in the center was the same. So he pinned my knight. Uh, I had to go, oh, no, and now castle have. Um, and uh, very often they go bishop g5 here these days uh, to pin this knight. And black would have the options for black would be either to come back with the bishop which is losing a tempo, uh, or go h6, bishop moves back to h4, and this spin is so annoying that at some point black has to go for g5, which has its obvious flaws. Well, number one, there are some sacrifices are possible, not uh, rarely, but possible like knight g5, or it just permanently weakens the king. So that's, uh, that is the, uh, the price to pay uh, in, in this position, assuming bishop g5 happens. And but Nils beat me with the bishop on g5, and I got in trouble on like move 12. I was oh. almost lost, so that was uh, uh, I would say he's an expert in these uh, pawn structures, or at least I wanted to be. <laughs> I want him to be an expert because otherwise I, I lost because it's all my fault. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I want to uh, I want to give more credit to Nils for, for beating me in, in the Bundesliga uh, last year. But this is interesting because often you think the Italian game is very calm and not so much going on maybe in the opening, but maybe it actually can be a bit tricky and tactical even in move 8, 10 or 12 um, mm -hmm. right before that. Um, uh, uh, there's also, you know, it can be very calm and soft and like lots of maneuvering, but it can be very harsh. For example, let's say black can go, let's say, a6, white, let's say, goes c3, black goes bishop a7, and then white goes h3. Uh, black goes h6, and after g5 and g4, white is in big trouble. So that's one of the ideas of Italian delay castle for black. Wait for this h3 move. Okay, maybe not h3 here. Let's say white goes through e1, black goes d6, and now white goes h3. Now after h6 and g5, why uh, white end up ends up in trouble usually? It's just just black does this, and then even castles long. It's un it could be unbelievably tense and. Um, uh, <clears throat> Um, so you never, it can go either way. If both players uh, are willing to go sharp, it can become crazy sharp. If both players are willing to take it slow, it can it can take a long uh, a maneuvering. Um, uh, oh, I, this is I, I think I've, I've lost some games with white in the, in the line you show with h6 and g5, and then black just gets some really fast attack out of nothing almost. Uh, and you're a bit surprised where did this come from? Because um, it doesn't look like Black lost to like moved the bishop to a7, then played h6 g5 instead of 
castle quickly rule, right? It, it yeah. violates some principles. But on the other hand, you can allow, you know, what do they say when, when, you're at, uh, when the attack is happening um, in, uh, on the flank, you should hit the center. But the problem is, if the center is closed, you cannot really hit it. Right, so here e4, e5, we have two pawns. D4 is not uh, happening anytime soon, at least in that line. You cannot hit the center, and then the attack is justified. And you can look at it and imagine if Black Castle won already. Then h6, g5 seems very, very natural, right? It's just the Black hasn't castled yet, but it's coming. Yeah. It was a very good game. Uh, Sergei Karakin played Jan Neponnishi. No, Neponnishi had white against Karakin in this line. And in move 10, he was almost lost with white pieces, like a year ago or so, with this h6, g5 line. And, but then, uh, but then he managed to survive. So <laughs> there are dangers for white as well. You don't, you don't think that uh, it is, but uh, this h6, g5 idea is um, quite, uh, quite, quite annoying. But it's not happening now. So maybe we should talk about this position there. No, but still, I think it's interesting for the viewers also to to know about this idea for for black in the in this position with this h six g five. And uh, uh, what's also interesting is that uh, in the last game Nils played with the white pieces. It was also an Italian game, but then David played knight f six instead of bishop c five, and his bishop mm -hmm. was on e seven for a long time, and the pawn on d six. So now we mm. see a different uh, position already, and. And Nils was doing pretty good in that game, I remember, and uh, he had some some advantage. So maybe already now uh, it's it's still early, but it seems like David uh, has improved a little bit on on his game compared to the last Italian uh, game he played. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that line with Bishop on e7 is extremely solid, but a little bit passive because that Bishop on e7 is uh, well in the way of its own pieces it's not attacking anything it's a passive piece by like if you have like classical bad fish right on, yeah, but yeah. if the bishop let's say black goes d6 even though on paper black would have a lot of pawns on dark squares they are not really in the way of the bishop right so it's you shouldn't look at these uh, definitions and rules like uh, blindly uh, blindly following it right you have to like um uh, that's like in karokan you know you have karokan and French defense. In French defense, it's a classical bad bishop on c8 for black. But in Karokan, it's jumped over the fence and mm -hmm. it's on f5 and it's not a bad bishop anymore. Yeah. It's a good bishop. It's uh, working on a long diagonal. The same here, even if black goes d6 now, the bishop has jumped over the fence and now it's doing a great job on this diagonal, controlling Absolutely. the f2, d4 squares, uh, and so on. So, mm, But in this position, that, in this position, I have a question because if yes. you play if you play d6 now, then bishop d5 looks like a strong move just to try, or maybe maybe knight c3 first, or just this this pin on f6. In some lines, it can become a bit uh, tricky for for black. That is true. That is true. Black goes d6, so it can go bishop g5, and there's the pin. It's really hard to unpin from it. The only uh, reasonable way is to do this, this, and now hit it with g5. And the sacrifice is not working here for many reasons. Reason number one, you need your rook on f1 to have yeah. f4, at least in the nearest future. And you have to move the king. It takes too much time. So black goes to king g7. Sometimes black can do knight b8, knight d7. And uh, so it's not working here. Yeah. So after g5, white would go bishop to g3. And not sure about the rook on e1 in this position. Maybe I would rather have my rook on f1. Because in many cases, black goes knight h5 and knight takes g3. And I want to have an option of taking this f pawn. Uh, taking this f pawn. But um, I, I think David is thinking because even though it's a theoretical position, there are many nuances here. He has plenty useful moves. He can he can go a6, bishop a7, which is very typical for this position, just to, to put that. To, I'm not sure if they call it a Rubinstein bishop, but it reminds me. Rubinstein has this queen maneuver. He had this queen b8, queen a7 maneuver, and queen g8, queen h7 in French defense. So uh, uh, basically that bishop on a7 would be sitting there waiting for, for its time. That's why, uh, and you want to stay away from c3, d4 coming with the tempo. So a6 and uh, bishop to e7, bishop a7, idea number one. Idea number two, just to go h6 and uh, stop this bishop g5 altogether. And... Uh, uh, to be honest, I never 
I don't think I, okay, I forgot what I analyzed in this position myself, but it could be that D5 is a possible move here, but I'm trying to compare to the other lines that are with the bishop on B5. So for example, black can hit it with D5 right now, takes six, and, uh, and say that, you know, I, I control, I open the center, I control the center, and uh, it doesn't seem that you can take here. Well, you can, but I have something, for example, the line that I have in mind is bishop takes f2, king takes f2, knight takes e5, and you cannot, ah, no, you can't recapture, my bad, my bad. Queen goes to f3, and then the knight on d5 is lost. So I think that pawn is poisoned. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the, that pawn is not poisoned, you can take seems to me and if takes takes queen f6 uh, i think i can take on d5 let's come here and bishop g4 oh i think i resigned here wait a sec well <laughs> maybe i'm going too fast <laughs> no no but, but this, uh, is, uh, this is again very interesting because it shows that you know even uh, what what looks like a calm position in the telling suddenly it can blow up in one yeah. second if both players are into it so hold yeah, on yeah. a second maybe that pawn is poisoned attack you cannot take on d5 you can come back to e2 but that's just sad i don't know bishop g4 or something that looks like a win so yeah. i think this pawn is poisoned it looks like, like a poisoned pawn to me it takes takes bishop g4 and of course the idea is it takes bishop g4 is a very nice very nice move uh, and I cannot stay on the first rank, and I cannot counterattack the queen. And yes, I'm losing here. So, does this mean that? Uh, and if rook takes queen f6, there's move queen e2, but it looks super fragile to me. I can still take on f2 and keep going. Yes, bishop takes f2. And, and you cannot capture because I take your rook, and you have to move the king. Then I move my knight, and I think. But I have no idea. Probably it's been analyzed at uh, h6 already played, so never mind. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure he was counting these lines. But the surprising part about all of these lines to me still is that white can just keep on playing this position. And white can just say, uh, even they move like c3. Let's say, let's say I play c3. White goes c3 and says like, yeah, I want to just play normal chess. And uh, the main problem if black pushes is d5, because uh, on paper, black is bad. Black has a pawn in the center. Black has great development, right? Safe king, uh, possible another pawn could be coming. Black should be better. The only problem for black in this position is this knight on c6. It's a terrible knight. This pawn restricts it. It has to defend this pawn. And there's no good way to defend that pawn on e5. Now it would be hanging because after takes, takes, I would have a d4 move in, in most of the lines. Oh, by the way, that was my mistake. Knight takes e5, takes, takes, queen f6, it's d4. It's d4, I forgot about the move. I blocked the diagonal and I defend the rook. Mm. And, and that's it. So for some reason, I forgot about this move. So black couldn't go d5 uh, in that position. But in many cases, black can still do it. And But even this would be a, a slight advantage for white because, because of this horrible knight that has no future. White is just going, knight goes here. Knight e4, knight g. White is just taking it slow. A4, b4. White is just playing as if everything is fine. And black has main problem with this knight on c6. And yeah. um, I'm trying to, to catch up on the chat. A lot of people are following uh, this broadcast, which is very nice. And Ed, Ed uh, says, uh, this opening, this is an opening. I'm learning to play. The analysis is great. So this is good hmm. for the viewers who are trying to, to figure out what to play in the Italian game. Um, and I have to say, I mean, for me at least, when I started playing chess, that was probably the first opening I learned to play, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but, but when you look at uh, your analysis now in, in a game like this, it shows that it's probably way much more complex than you actually think when you, when you start to play the Italian game. Um, you learn, you know, mm -hmm. five, six, seven moves, and then then you don't think too much about it, but... But all these different sidelines and, and tactics uh, is, is very nice to, to mm -hmm. look at, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's so nuanced. There are so many. And when you look at, uh, at this one with the engine, you would not see all these nuances at all. It's just uh, 0 0.2 or whatever is the number of your engine everywhere. And, 
and <laughs> what do I do with, with that number, right? What yep. are the typical ideas? Where do my pieces go? What, do, what are the ideas that black have? What do ideas the white have? I think they are now transposing to, uh, to, the, main, uh, to the main lines and it's going to go H3 now. And that's going to go A6 or A5. And it would transpose because this was uh, not a typical move order. Um, the, the main move order of uh, Italian is uh, uh, knight F, uh, they go C3 here, knight F6 and D3 and castle and castle and uh, something like this. But here they tried uh, the, this move order and um, not C3 but rook E1. Actually, I'm not an expert in Italian. I'm still, I'm still recovering. Like I'm still trying to understand uh, all these, uh, all these ideas myself. But uh, mm, so no, no more G5 ideas. And now uh, playing D4 would lose a tempo, as I mentioned before, right? Uh, but it comes with a tempo, so uh, maybe it's not necessarily uh, a losing, um, losing a tempo. Okay, d6 happened. Uh, mm -hmm. White has ideas of b4, d4, h3. These are the the useful uh, the useful moves that uh, that white can do in this position. Knight bd2. Uh, all of these moves uh, have some point to it. Black's uh, list of uh, things to do here is a6 or a5. So, for example, a5, if uh, David chooses to go a5 in this position. Ah, sorry, it's white to move. So, but uh, if the pawn goes to a5, it stops the b4 idea, right? So that's an upside to playing b5. The downside is Recording the d5 in square progress. is forever weak. Almost like it's uh, uh, white can occupy it with the bishop, with the knight, and black doesn't have b5 idea on its own. The the, the idea of black goes a6, black uh, doesn't have to worry about the b5 square, and um, but the problem is b4 is on back on the table. Sometimes black goes a5 and then moves the bishop back anyway. But another idea of a5 is that this bishop doesn't leave c5. If you go a6, the bishop often has to leave because it will be kicked by b4. So uh, uh, there are so many nuances. Black goes a6, white goes a4, and now black goes a5. There's a lot mm. like black loses the tempo just to provoke a4. There are so, uh, but um, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure them out myself, you know. Uh, uh, there are courses, there are lectures on Italian, or you can just keep it simple. You can just play whatever. You will not get advantage with white as long as you don't run into this G5, G4 idea. Uh, I don't think you can get in trouble with white. You will not get an advantage. That's also understandable. But, um, but um, yeah, and, and Kevin Kevin on the chat says, I get into trouble when black plays D5, as mentioned uh, uh, by you. But maybe yeah. you show that... Um, there are some resources for white. Uh, it looks scary, but uh, either d4 in the position we looked at, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and he says that often the d3 pawn uh, becomes either a problem or a weakness when he plays. That's the, true. The, the, the uh, uh, so let, uh, let me show a little line. So let's say d5 takes, takes, and let's imagine this pawn is, is poison. It is, it isn't. White can take. But let's say uh, white doesn't uh, take it, and white plays, for example, knight bd2. And the only, uh, and how, do, let's say black goes through three, how are you going to attack this? Pawn? And let's say I move my bishop back, which is a passive move. But let's say, how do you attack this pawn? If black plays bishop to f5 attacking this pawn, I always have this move knight to e4, blocking this bishop. And that's it. There's no more pressure whatsoever. If black decides to go to move the knight, then move the bishop, then move the queen, then go rook a to d8, we always put the bishop on c2 to defend from the D file. And if bishop goes to F5, he put the knight on E4. And yeah. there's no other way to attack that pawn. There's no, and white can just simply go on the, on the king side uh, with the pieces. Sometimes you can even launch A4, D4 for white, but don't exchange this bishop. That's the bottom line. If these bishops were gone, imagine for a second that the light squared bishop got exchanged. Oh yes, that's a major problem, the pawn of D3. Like would double the rooks and how do you defend it? I don't know. I don't know how to defend. Like you have to move the knight, 
moves the bishop, moves the queen, rook to d, you become really passive. But here, one bishop will take care of everything. You can triple pieces on the d file. The bishop says, I don't care. And you, uh, like in theory, the bishop can go to a6 and attack from that side, but it's almost impossible to execute. And then I would put the knight on c4. I would yeah. put the knight on that diagonal where bishop goes. And that's it. So that's the way you deal with, the, with this pawn. Don't exchange this bishop. Even though if it's on c2, it looks horrible on c2. It looks like the most uh, passive piece uh, in the position. But uh, the, uh, the trick is the, there's a reason why they call it Spanish bishop. Mm -hmm. Lopez, I'm not a Spanish bishop. I see. So it's standing. Let's say this bishop somehow goes to c2 in the future. Looks super passive. There are pawns in the way, but at some point you're going to push d4, and then maybe you push e5 if black recaptures, and then you deliver checkmate on h7. So that bishop has very strong potential. You should not exchange that bishop. So and that's why very often, let's say bishop b3 is one of the moves here. And if uh, that goes bishop e6 if white wants advantage why often can even do this and say okay here it's bad because there's uh, there you go here i can show you another idea that black can often do in this position that with the reason why you need to play h3 here this knight goes to g4 attacks your pawn and let's say you defend it and black has this f5 idea mm. and then knight just comes back and then black open their file and white will be in trouble here that's why they go h3 to stop this knight g4 f5 idea there, but you cannot go h3 if black did not castle because then g5 g4 is coming yeah but if black idea. castled yeah. you can go h3 so there are so many nuances that you don't see if you just uh watch with with the engine so this is the position we have right now you said thank you and yeah, also so the move here yeah and also as kevin says in the chat uh, so move order is also important i guess in in some of these lines yeah, unless you're a specialist, you should think carefully uh, on the move. Like uh, Black can often launch this h6, g5 attack, even if I didn't play h3. That's what amazes me. So I just castled, and Black goes a6, bishop a7, h6, g5, g4, and then long castle anyway, even though there's no hook on h3. So even that is a valid idea. I've seen uh, some games, uh, my good friend, I mean, Bassam, the best uh, uh, African player of all time, I guess. Um, uh, he plays Italian all his life with white and he had trouble with this line, even though the engine said he had a good position, but it's very hard to play from a practical point of view. So if you castle, be careful with h6, g5. If you castle and played h3 and black didn't castle, oh, you could be in trouble. <laughs> so. If black castle short, you can go h3 yourself. That's for white. And uh, yeah, it's just the ideas off the top of my head. But there are so many of them. And and if you look with the engine, it's all 0 0.2. It's like, but the, there is, but only when you make a mistake, the engine would say that, uh, uh, the engine would say that uh, you're in trouble. And I'd be the two. Yeah, so now I guess we have a fairly normal uh, position uh, out of the mm -hmm. opening in this Italian game. And and with the move knight to d2, what, what is Nils, uh, Nils's plan? Is it to maneuver the knight, go to g3, or to play more on the on the queen side? Or uh, Usually it's knight f1, knight g3. That's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the way it is. That's a typical route for the knight in Italian and in Rui Lopez. And um, uh, that's where he, uh, knight ne almost never goes to c4 or b3. It's, uh, um, yeah, the knight is coming to f1, and he's trying to save a tempo on h3 because maybe he doesn't need that move, right? Maybe, uh, maybe he can, uh, if somebody appears on g4, he'll get to kick it away. So he, he's trying to win a tempo. So if he goes to g3 with the knight, Maybe he, the, he can play h3 later. He can focus on uh, pushing d4. Now, now, by the way, d4 is like always the only idea of a lot. Let me see. Yeah, white, is, white needs to go knight f1, knight g3, and then push d4. He gets the center. And, and black and if, should try. And if David now plays knight g4, is the plan to, to, to play uh, rook e2? To rook e2, well, that's right. Rook e2. And there's no f5. 
because there's the pin. And I'm in time to go H3 and kick the knight away. And then I don't have to come back to F1. So let's say black goes, I don't know, some useful move like H6. We go H3, knight F8. I don't have to come back to E1, right? I can, and we just return to the to the usual position. But maybe I keep it on E2. I don't know, I'm just going to do the typical stuff. And so uh, white wins like half a tempo, I would say. White mm -hmm. can always come back to E1, which would be as if black played A6 and we played H3. But white can keep that half a tempo for now and do what is more important. Now. So here, I don't think time G4 is a good idea. Although sometimes there's this idea, let's say black goes instead of A6, looking at A, preparing F5. And white goes h3, and sometimes black can go f5 immediately here, mm -hmm. leaving the knight hanging. That's another idea that to watch out for white and to bear in mind uh, for black. And if you take, it takes, and suddenly this monster bishop, the rook, the queen comes to h4, the pawn comes to g3, suddenly wow. white would be in trouble. Out of blue, move 11, <laughs> and yeah. white could be in trouble. Like, let's say if you go to h2, that's a uh, black goes g3, and that's the monster bishop attacks here, attacks here, and white is in trouble. If you come back, you're already in big trouble. Bishop goes to g4, and uh, this is an unstoppable attack. Black would just take, give up the rook, and then the queen is cut. That's just it. White is lost here. Wow. Uh, if, if you just play the, the logical moves, if you come back to e1, and uh, maybe queen h4, uh, there is this attack, queen h4, f2 is hanging, g3 is coming. It's really, really dangerous. But white doesn't have to take. White can take on f5, and now the knight is hanging, and you cannot recapture. And uh, yeah, if you come back, then that will just defend the pawn and come here. So black, yeah, I think that's the problem. So black has to like do something like this, but that would not be. As you know, two pieces are better than rook and pawn. And this, this position is uh, no exception. Pieces mm. would eventually crawl out of the cage and uh, black would be, uh, even though the, the engine bar gives zeros, but my understanding is that uh, this is not, uh, like if you're using the, the most modern engine with this neural network, what's it, no, uh, evaluation, uh, N N U E the four letters yep. where it's using the um, artificial intelligence. Uh, um, what does it call? My words get my mind. So it doesn't use the the formula. It uses the knowledge obtained by uh, artificial intelligence engines. The evaluation would be uh, to its advantage. So uh, Stockfish without this new function uh, evaluates two pieces versus rook and pawn. Uh, incorrectly very often. So watch out for that. Uh, so yes, that's, uh, but this is, but white doesn't have to take, white can dump, do some other move. Apparently like queen e1 is good. I don't know. And now, now, now this would be hanging apparently, but it's, I, I it's very difficult, very difficult. Black, um, so these are also the ideas. That's why you need to play h3 to prevent these kind of ideas, or you need to be a very um, strong and nuanced player to, to see that, oh, knight g4, f5 doesn't work. Knight g4, like that doesn't work, that I can delay this h3 move. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Um, mm. But uh, uh -huh. yeah, we, we, we won't get uh, <laughs> a similar position uh, with the with knight g4. Um, yeah. So it looks but like- Again, uh, went like this, uh-huh. Okay, I think it's more or less modern approach. You say black is trying to save one tempo. Mm -hmm. So usually it's a6, bishop a7. But now it's just it's just bishop immediately to b6. Okay. So the downside to this is that white can take this bishop. For example, white can go bishop b3 and then go knight c4 and take that bishop. That's downside number one. The upside to bishop b6, the next move that uh, David is planning to do is to go knight e7, knight g6. <clears throat> because uh, again, the same story. This knight is a horrible piece. 
pawn is restricting its movement, the pawn on e5, own pawn restrict, like this knight is doing nothing. But if it goes to g6, black can uh, catch the, so for example, if white goes, let's say knight f1, and black goes, ah, no, white has to go uh, something like h3 first. So let's say h3, black goes knight e7, white goes knight f1, black goes knight g6, white goes knight g3, black goes c6, and black would be first one to push b5. The trick in these positions is the first one to push the d pawn. If white is the one uh, pushing d4 first, white is better. If black pushes d5 first, black is uh, totally fine. So for example, here after bishop b3, we would have total symmetry with an extra move for white, which is what it's supposed to be, right? When, uh, when you're playing white pieces. And now d5, I think now we transpose to one of the main positions. Now after it takes, it's knight takes. And you cannot take on e5 because after takes takes there's this problem on f2 which takes f2 remember in the lines uh, at the start yep. of the stream here queen f3 was the trick but now black played c6 as the knight is defended so that's the difference like one pawn move that's now black is winning in that line white was winning but the, the knight on b5 is defended by a pawn and white loses material so you cannot take that pawn, and white usually goes d4 here. And after takes takes, uh, I think one of the moves here for black is bishop to e6, which which shocked me the first time I saw it. Oh. It's just bishop to go to e6 and somehow try to hold. Or uh, I think they also do bishop to d7, and they let white have this isolated pawn. But black says, yeah, I can handle that. Mm -hmm. I can handle an isolated pawn, and I will survive here. So I, uh, we could be heading in this, in this direction. So that is the idea for black. Maneuver that bad knight from c6, g6, and push c6, d5, and save a tempo on a6, bishop a7. And very often, just like white's bishop is going to c2 in these positions, black's bishop also wants to go to c7 uh, to support the center. So uh, now, now, it's, uh, now it's the Nils' turn. Uh, and, uh, and, and, what... and while Niels is thinking, we have a good question from uh, Roger on the chat. How okay. how does the C1 bishop get into the game? And I guess it, it, the same question mm -hmm. goes for the, the light squared bishop on, on C8 as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the way it goes in, that's a very good question. Sometimes it doesn't, but <laughs> if, it's, if it does, the approximate line goes like this. I'm going to make moves. So let's say, 90, uh, let's say h3, 97. Knight f1, knight g6, knight here, c6, bishop b3. And let's say black doesn't push e5. Let's say black does this. And then we go d4, and then black goes like, I don't know, like bishop d7 or whatever. Now bishop goes to e3. OK, no, e4 pawn is hanging. So white first goes bishop to c2, and then goes bishop e3. Let's say black goes, uh, I don't know, queen 7 I'm going to do weird moves. White goes bishop e3. And that's it. That's how you develop the bishop. And then the next idea is you go queen d2 and take on h6. That's a yeah. really dangerous idea. So if black does this, we go queen d2, and very often bishop h6 would be a devastating attack. For example, let's say black goes just a random move. Now white is already winning. Doesn't yeah. look like a win, but the next move is knight g5. And then the next move is knight h5. And the pieces just, and sometimes the rook would come. This or, or bishop from this, that's it. That's like plus, that, there's no way. If that queen was on e7, then queen f8, queen e8, queen f8 would kick the queen. So so a better move for black could be queen e7 here, but then you have to take knight f5 into account. So there are so many nuances, but the bottom line is white pushes d4, and then bishop goes to e3. That's, that, is, uh, that is the way. I, many, many years ago, I played... Um... A similar position with the white pieces, and I had the bishop on c2, and and I and I got yeah, I had the knight on f3, g3, uh, bishop e3, queen d2, and then I did sacrifice mm -hmm. on h6, and then in the end of the game, the bishop on c2 uh, was standing there for the whole game, but then it helped deliver mate after 30 moves, uh, and I just pushed e5, and then the bishop uh, checked the uh -huh. king on h7, and suddenly it was mate, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful game. Um, that's so exactly why they call it the Spanish bishop. It's just standing yep. there, seemingly doing nothing. And then the when moment comes, it's like, oh boy, 
Okay. And also in that game, the queen, I believe, was on c7. And, and that's why this uh, sacrifice on h6 is so effective, because mm -hmm. this piece is, is a bit upside on, on the queen side. And it's so difficult mm -hmm. to defend when you open up the, the position. Mm -hmm. um, that is true. That is why, that is why uh, black has to, uh, to try to be the first one to push d5, because if white is the first one to push d4, and then it's difficult. Then it's difficult. Unless you like take it, like uh, do say, if you do nothing, this is white's plan. There should be three, queen d2, and then take on h6. And it's really hard to do anything about that. Black yeah. can try king h7 in that position, but then white has a bishop on c2. And that's really unpleasant when the bishop is looking at your king. So I think that the fight would be now, okay, so h3, I'm expecting knight to e7. Uh, I also want to, uh, to mention that. White should watch out for this bishop. So, for example, black can play a sneaky move like a6. And if white continues with the obvious move knight f1, black says, ha, got your bishop. Mm -hmm. I got your bishop. It's not running. I'm, I'm, I'm removing your bishop. I'm getting two bishop advantage. And I'm going to claim even an advantage for black. Because that's so white has to be careful. So if black goes knight a5 now, the bishop says, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still, I can still get out. I can still get up. Black can actually trap the bishop for an exchange like this, but it comes with a cost for, for a completely misplaced knight. So, and otherwise the bishop goes to c2. It wants to go there anyway in many cases. So uh, I'm expecting a knight to e7, followed by knight e6, followed by c6 and d5. And maybe we would see that isolated uh, pawn position. Yeah. And also suspect Nils will be aware if, if David plays a a6 because... Um... A couple of games ago, uh, Nils played bishop a4 uh, without uh, David playing a6 in, in the real Lopez. And I think Magnus Carlsen uh, played this a couple of years ago uh, with the idea mm -hmm. to just get the bishop back to c2 after you play c3. So, so I suspect he's very, he's very keen on keeping his, uh, his light squared bishop uh, in, in these positions. And... Uh, it seems a bit strange, you know, for white to play bishop a4 uh, unprovoked, but it makes also a lot of sense just to, to keep it in the game after c3 and bring it back back to uh -huh. c2. Um, so it's it's a it's a nice idea for for white. Yeah, I don't know what else can David play except my e7. Like a6 seem inconsistent now, except with the tricky sneaky idea. But yeah. uh, otherwise, you would rather have your bishop on a7. Than on mm -hmm. d6. Uh, so a6 uh, seems inconsistent to me. Uh, what else? Rook e8. There's also bishop e6 move that black can try to trade the bishops, but then maybe white would not trade it. Maybe white would still go to d5. a5 also seems inconsistent to me with bishop d6, because why would you leave c5 and lose a tempo? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a6 and a5. Doesn't seem good to me. So maybe rook e8, knight e7, or bishop to e6. Yeah, yeah and d5, I think it's still not working. d5, you, you always have to check d5 yeah. all the time. You should be like for white and for, or maybe maybe I can go d5. Maybe it's working. But now it's still not working because takes, takes, there's always this d4 or knight f3 move. Uh, it's just not working. So maybe he can try rook e8 with an idea d5. But the problem is, again, we're, we're going to have this position that, that that we talked about. And white goes knight g3. Uh, it actually still fascinates me that white is better. Because uh, I was told all my life that uh, if you have a pawn in the center, it's base advantage and decent development. Uh, and there's like an obvious weakness on d3, right? That's a, It's not really a backward pawn, but uh, that's, a, that's a weak pawn because it cannot be protected. By another, but that's by a definition that's a weak square on d3. No pawn can defend it, and black can attack. But the reality is, black cannot attack. Like, how? I don't see how black can attack yeah. that pawn, and white will just keep going uh, a for b. For, okay, b4 is still hanging here, but uh, it still amazes me that white is back in this position. White is putting pressure on this pawn. If black goes a f6, that weakens all the light squares on the king side. If black doesn't go f6, very hard to support this pawn. This should be five is coming. And white has many useful moves in this position. A4, this should be two, queen e2, knight e4, knight h5 sometimes. It's 
And it's very hard to find a plan for black in this position. It amazes me every time I see yeah. it. Because it's just a bad night on C6. That's one of the main reasons. This is a very bad night. Maybe if it was standing on G6 and black played something like C6, then black would be maybe bad. I would uh, relate to that. But this night, terrible piece and it has no future. No future. And all of white's pieces are good. Every single piece, okay, except the rook on A1, but you cannot have both good rooks if there's like no open files. But all of white's pieces are active. The bishop is doing, the knight is attacking here. This knight is ready to jump and the bishop is, like all the pieces that white has are active. And for black is, okay, the bishop is good and the knight on D5 is good. That's it. All the other pieces are passive or doing nothing. It amazes me uh, every time I see it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I do suspect that David might have a little sink here. So, uh, Mikhailo, um, you actually have made now uh, two accessible uh, ports, and uh, both right. of them, both of them, will be on sale today. So oh, go uh, buy the the courses for a good price, and they're called World Champions Blunder and uh, the Initiative in Chess: A How to Guide. And we, as exactly. we can see, uh, David played ninety seven. We can come come back to that, but yeah, tell us a little bit about these courses and and why people should uh, should buy them. Mm. Well, uh, you can at least watch the free preview videos and uh, judge it for yourself. But the, my first course uh, uh, initiative in chess, how to guide. Um, uh, it's about initiative, right? Because what what I noticed that in uh, all the platforms, uh, all the um, you either have tactics. Right when you deliver final winning combination, right or secure a draw if you have a bad position, and you have uh, openings, right, the very beginning of the game, and tactics is basically the end of the game, right, uh, like when you should deliver a winning combination. You also have strategy, right? You have some positional concepts, some pawn structures, but what about if the position is completely open, but there's no win yet, right? So let's say position opened up. There are no pawn, uh, um, you know, chains in the center where you have to use like, oh, that square is weak. Let me maneuver my knight three, like like here. The only reason why this this maneuver three move maneuver makes sense. The only reason is because the, the center is completely closed, right? If the D and E file were completely open, that would not be an option to just maneuver one piece for three moves, right? You would have to quickly develop pieces and attack something. So you have to have a different set of mind when you're playing open dynamic positions, when there are no pawns fixed in the center or they are fluid, they, are, they can move any moment now, but you're not winning yet, right? So like, uh, what do you do? There's no tactics to calculate yet, right? You have to build up the pressure. You have to create some threats. So how do you think in those positions? In closed, slow position. This is a slow position, right? Because... Mm, uh, the, the, the one uh, tell that I have is that how do you tell which position uh, how to think in which position if the position is slow it means you have a lot of time what I mean by a slow position if there are barely any threats what's like uh, I, it's even hard to come up with a forcing move for one like how can you possibly create even a single threat in this position I don't know like maybe D4 qualifies this, but it's not like it's an exchange offer at best, right? So there are no threats, no forcing moves. That's a quiet position, right? It means that you have time to maneuver, improve, take three moves to improve one piece, right? That is not an option when there are open files and diagonals in the center. And that's exactly what the course about initiative is it's all about. How to think in such positions where... Uh, you don't have time for slow maneuvering, but there's no final combination to deliver yet, right? How do you get from, from a good position to delivering a combination? So basically, that's uh, it's a collection of uh, uh, games uh, of my own that I analyzed very, very deeply. And there are puzzles where there's one best option in the position and you have to find it. All the others are not close as good, but it's not a win. So that's the problem. I, I, um, I don't uh, remember any courses like that. Uh, there are books, certainly, uh, for this topic, but courses were not a win yet, but clearly a best option available. And how do you find it? So I give my approximate algorithm of uh, what questions to ask, what, uh, what uh, things to look at, and so on and so on in that uh, initiative course. Um, and, uh, and the World Champions Blunder is uh, my first course. Uh, it's a tactical course um, based on the first 
four world champions, Tanya Slasker, Capablanca, and uh, Alekai. Uh, I've analyzed all of their games, uh, all of that that I have in the mega base, uh, found uh, all the tactical oversights and their combinations, of course, um, all mistakes and all uh, strong combinations. And um, I've analyzed them and um, sorted them into the first, you have easy ones. Uh, at the end of the chapter, oh boy, they are really, really difficult. So everyone from a club level player to, to, to GM level can find uh, a lot of puzzles. Uh, that, uh, and, and it also feels good to play better than Alekhine or Capablanca. You know, you see in this position, he played this move. Uh, but of course, you have a benefit of knowing there's a win, right? Somebody did all the work. So that's like 90% of seeing a combination during the game is knowing that there is one, right? It's so yeah. much easier to do a puzzle uh, then to to find the tactics in a combination in a game, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And uh, so that that's a big difference between uh, between those who will uh, study the course and the world champions. But at the end of each chapter, I end the chapter with the combination they actually delivered in the games, and there's a fantastic combination that you would not see in all the other books because I checked every single game they played since they were like ten or twelve, whatever there was in in Megabits. But I also give there an um, my uh, approximate uh, algorithm of uh, how to uh, how to find uh, tactical uh, how to find tactical uh, puzzles and um, how to. Uh, uh, I, I lost focus. Uh, I give approximate algorithm how to think and what to pay attention to in any tactical position. Because uh, for me, it comes natural. I look at the position and somehow, if it's not too sophisticated, somehow I immediately get the solution. And I have no idea how I got it. It just dawns on me. So I cannot really teach it. But then I started to see signals. That the position is signaling you that something is wrong with it and like loose pieces, loose kink, and so on and so on. And um, uh, I tell what signs the position tells you something is wrong from tactical point of view. Look at these signs and then uh, consider four things. They give approximate algorithm of how to solve uh, tactical puzzles. You cannot have a universal algorithm, but at least uh, what to pay attention to and what should be a mindset when you're doing tactics. Uh, I also uh, do that in that course. And I'm working on the third one, which should be World Champions Blunder 2, or maybe some other name, uh, where I'm uh, currently analyzing all the games uh, of the next World Champions. Uh, where the second, who's that? Oive, between Nix, Mislov, and Tal. And uh, uh, you would see all the Tal's combinations and all the combinations that he missed or, the, uh, or um, uh, for himself or uh, his opponents. Uh, missed. So these are the courses. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. And you bring up very many interesting thoughts because for many, let's say, a bit lower rated players, they don't have necessarily the same intuition as strong players mm -hmm. like you. To, to they have, I, I would say you and 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 you know uh, the strongest players in the world, they have this intuition that okay, there is some tactics in this position. Yeah. They just feel it and then they look for it, you know, the concrete uh, variations. And um, often when people ask me or, you know, uh, anyone uh, how to improve uh, my level in chess, I think it's also so important to develop this uh, tactical skills uh, as a chess player. It's, it's, it's really important both to, in terms of defending, but also in terms of attacking and all, also yeah. uh, always have your eye out looking for these uh, possibilities in, in a game and uh, it can happen in many different ways you know you can have a positional advantage which after yeah. a long time you actually will very often have tactical um, uh, motives after pushing mm -hmm. uh, you're pressing the whole game positionally and your opponent yeah. might have a couple weaknesses and suddenly all these different tactical motives appear because uh, you cannot hold the position together anymore you're defending defending um, yeah. So I would say to the viewers out there, I mean, yeah, go go check it out because it's so important uh, to to develop uh, an understanding uh, of this in, yeah. in, in chess. And uh... I was uh, blessed with this feeling, you know. Now, now if they show me any position, I get this uh, feeling that oh, there could be a hold on a second. I wanna like I don't know what it is, uh, uh, but then I started to like uh, reverse engineer it. 
you know what they they say that they do in the army so if they like to get a vehicle or or a rocket or a ship they try to reverse engineer it how it works so that you'll be able to recreate it on your own so i i figured out like what actually is a drew, drew my attention here right so instead of using subconscious brain i'm using conscious brain like what exactly is wrong with this position? Uh, I got it because I solved uh, thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of puzzles, and it created naturally. That's uh, that's a good road. But what if uh, you did not do it? And what if you're an adult learner and not a young chess prodigy, where uh, you shouldn't do this algorithm? You should. It should come naturally, right? But if you're an adult learner, club player, and you want to become better at tactics, uh, you have to use your uh, logic and conscious brain. Uh, because your default settings may not be good, right? So, so you can improve on them uh, by using uh, this more systematic approach to tactics that uh, that they give in that World Champions Blunder course. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and I have a quiz for you. Uh, do you know which former world champion uh, has birthday today? He's not alive. I give you that hint. So, but he it's his birthday today. So he would have been. Okay, I, I won't say how old he would have been, but it's his birthday. And it's unfortunately no longer with us, but it's his birthday today. So uh, I know that uh, our uh, most famous painter and uh, um, uh, Ukrainian Taras Shevchenko has a birthday today. He's a national mm -hmm. symbol, even in, in uh, post-Soviet countries, even in Russia, in Kazakhstan, they have monuments to him. So mm -hmm. this is today's is his birthday, but okay. I don't know the answer to your, to your okay. question. Okay, so it's, it's Bobby Fischer's birthday. Oh my God! Okay, Bobby Fischer would have been seventy-nine today. Um, okay, and I think yesterday um, it was eight years mm. ago since uh, Capablanca had his um, funeral. So Capablanca died eight years ago. So uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm still working. Yeah. I'm still working on my. I used to be terrible at chess history. At some point, I already GM for many years. I would not name the world champions even in the right order. And I'm confessing it live on Chess TV. <laughs> <laughs> and so, oh, okay, I would, but it take me some, okay, let's see. Not even dates, not even years. It's just the order <laughs> would be yeah. difficult for me. Uh, and I'm not even talking about, and then Oiva uh, lost the title, and then this, and then that. Uh, these years, both Vinnik was three times. Like, no, it was just, that was there. But now I was working at this World Champions Wonder course. Um, I'm learning the history of chess. I discovered fascinating things, like, uh, for example, it still fascinates me that um, Yuri Averbach is 100 years old, and I'm watching games of Tal, like 1950 or something, and I see Averbach, Yuri, <laughs> and then I see him on the stream, like, two days ago, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> it's all connected, and, I'm, and I was not aware of that, it uh, amazes me. Uh, the the chess history so i uh, when i get to fisher i'll i'll i'll, I'll be better at those quizzes yeah, <laughs> for yeah, now for... first four champion first world war champions i did i did my research like half a year ago hopefully it's still somewhere in the background of my mind very good and and looking into chess history looking at the games of former world champions um do you have any favorite player that inspired you as a chess player at all of the former or yeah mm. former world champions uh, yeah, I, I was always afraid of this question because I don't have a good answer to it. <laughs> I uh, Because I know many very strong players and world champions. Magnus, they have like a book, the first book that they studied like 50 times, the same book. I don't have that, uh, unfortunately, in my education. I uh, uh, So I don't have a favorite. I do not have a favorite at all. And it was not like I take a book of other kinds of Capablanca games and I and I uh, look through them. So that's that's one of the flaws of my uh, of my chess education. But hopefully, I will somewhat uh, recover by doing these courses for the world and uh, trying to become better. Like I literally check all the okay the. the the, the stockfish is checking the game of course and i'm like uh, looking whether it makes sense from a human point of view does this puzzle make sense or it's like stockfish nonsense that nobody can understand so i'm only picking the puzzles that make sense from human point of view and of course i look through the games every single game at least briefly click through so i have an understanding what is uh, what was going on uh, back in the day but no i do not have a, a favorite <laughs> yeah that, i mean that's that's fair enough and um ed on chat saying um did you say uh, Mikhailo has a book or video on this uh, he was just describing? Yes. So we were discussing the two chessable courses he has he has made, uh, which is called World Champions Blunder and the Initiative in Chess, a how-to guide. 
So check out uh, the two courses on Chessable and they will be on sale today. So yeah, yeah. wait, wait for sale. It would be like yeah. usually a sales on Chessable are pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah <laughs> compared absolutely. To the, yeah. So uh, so check it out and, and get a good deal on, on those courses. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention, you know, when we're talking about chess history, former world champions, um, I asked Magnus a few years ago uh, mm -hmm. a, a similar question. I believe, mm. I, I believe he answered um, Al-Yekhin. So mm -hmm. obviously a very important, influential world champion. But somehow he's, he doesn't get the same, uh, at least uh, in, in, in my upbringing. I mean, he didn't get the same attention as, you know, Capablanca or Fischer mm -hmm. or, you know, Karpov, Kasparov. But it was interesting that that was his answer because he really, I think he really liked the way Aliyehin played, and also he had some interesting ideas in general, uh, mm -hmm. how to approach the game, and also in the opening and so on. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a very interesting topic to discuss, uh, I think. And I'm glad to hear that you're mm -hmm. now into in more into chess history than you were before. Uh, so that's that's good. Yeah. Uh, and Alekhin, yes, Alekhin is the better pronunciation, but in English, I think they pronounce Alekhin. But yeah. Alekhin is the, what he he wanted people to call him. Uh, anyways, but he was really hardworking. Unlike Capablanca, he was really, really hardworking. And I think his feeling of initiative was amazing. Capablanca was like a natural talent. His hands knew what to do, right? Yeah. He was barely thinking. He just, okay, it's not the hand. It was all the all the practice and all, all he did before. But he was much more intuitive player. For example, in, in that course, there, there was a game where he completely outplayed uh, Alekhin dominated the whole game but when he needed to calculate carefully he he relaxed a little bit missed and it was a draw it was a perpetual and there's a puzzle from uh, and that was like a pivotal game of the match because if he wins it uh he uh, i think that was the match where he lost the title to, to Alec. and because his hand knew what to do but you can do uh, as much with the hand until you have to be very specific and calculate the final combination, right? But mm -hmm. he was not very specific. He thought, whatever, everything is winning. And it was only one move that was winning. And um, we can just uh, flick in. They played A4 and A5. Uh, I guess it doesn't yeah. change. But uh, I want to I wanna check a little bit this because D4. So Nils mm -hmm. decided to go D4 immediately, right? getting the center and now david comes back to c6 like losing oh. two tempos why on earth does that make sense so the only reason it makes sense is because this pawn is now hanging right because if white has already had knight on g3 that would be a waste of time but now this pawn is hanging you don't want to take and you lose all your advantage you don't want to push because now you're worse because now now your bishop is bad that's a monster bishop black plans to go f5 white is worse so but the pawn is hanging what do you do about that if you go knight f1, it takes takes and d5, ah, or even knight x e4 is possible. Takes d5, ruining the center, taking two bishops. White is in huge trouble. It's unbelievable. So the, the, the only reason it makes sense because there is no good way to protect this pawn on d4. Like you have to like make some weird moves. So he played a4, and the idea is, wait a second, takes, 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 uh, a5, knight f3, knight f3, bishop c5. Uh, the idea is that if you take, it's take, and if knight takes, it's uh, a5, I think. And now this bishop has no good place to go, so takes first, takes first, bishop gives c5. Okay, the bishop is not trapped, but it could be trapped like this. I think like, like there's a tactical just, or maybe I, ah, maybe I take first and then attack. Ah, I get text through b3. Oh, now, now it makes sense, yeah. Now it makes sense. This bishop has no place to go. Yeah. Goes yeah, to b6, play, yeah. I kick it. If you go to c5, I, I take, take, and uh, on paper we have one pawn extra, but I have two bishops, and e5, e5 is coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, black is in big trouble. And also I can go e5 right now. Uh, so black is in trouble. So that's the point. That is the point. But with, without the pawn on a4, without the pawn on a4, imagine the pawn is on a2. Like just comes back to b6 and says thank you for for an extra pawn. Yeah, I appreciate. It. So that's the idea of a4, and that's that's why David responded with a5, and now rook a3. Wow, very interesting. 
oh wow, the idea is if black takes a free poem, it's a free poem, or it, free, it looks free. The idea is that Rook will penetrate here and launch the attack on the king. Wait a sec. Maybe you go Rook D3 first to kick this bishop out. Bishop goes to D6. And now you go to G3, for example. And then, oh my God, when I see a Rook on G3, I get terrified, you know? The knight moves, bishop takes H6. Oh my God, that looks really dangerous. Or, yeah. or I can go E5 first. E5, sorry, kicks the knight. Yeah, E5 kicks the knight. Then this knight is, oh my God, black is in huge trouble. Yeah. Oh, that's a good, oh, ace, Rook A3. I love this idea. The problem is black doesn't have to take. And if black doesn't take this rook, is just silly. So probably black would just have to just play any any reasonable move in this position. But then white may say, yeah, okay, but now then I'm moving my knight there. I guess that's the idea. And also maybe later in the game, you know, the rook can come, not if not to g3, maybe to d3, e3. Um, if black helps you with e takes d3, yeah. that's right. I guess at some point uh, the tension in the center will be uh, over and. Uh, yeah, I also mm -hmm. love I love you know uh, swinging rooks or rook lifts you know and then bring it across. Uh, it's not often you're able to do it, but uh, when it works, it's just uh, yeah. It's just I, amazing. I, you know, you know, I have a flaw uh, uh, in like I find it diff like I always seen these rook lifts on third and sixth rank for for white and for black, right? Like this, like mm -hmm. e three rook g three rook a three rook g three. That somehow uh, is already natural to me. But sometimes there are swings like fourth rank, and I always overlook them because, like, if let's say white has a pawn on e5 or for whatever reason, right? Uh, and then the rook, and I in one game I missed the lift like that, and I was completely losing immediately. A rook is extremely powerful piece if it's looking at the king, so uh, yeah, rook lift amazes me till this day because I'm bad at it. And every time I see it's working, I'm like, oh, that's amazing, I should try to do that sometime, yeah, yeah. But it's like we're programmed to just see rookie three, you know, and rookie six, and not as you mentioned one one square further. Um, yeah. yeah, even though it's totally the same idea, but usually one of those squares is taken, and it doesn't make sense. So we are just abandoning the idea altogether, even though it's better to check it and then see it's not working. But I'm not even checking it, so I'm aware of it. I'm not sure what to do about that. So look at and. Um, yeah, I do suspect that David will have uh, a little thing here. So let's have a yeah. very short break uh, to catch our breath. And then we'll be back in uh, a few minutes. So stay tuned. Okay. Stay tuned.
I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of towards something a bit more real where I could actually create things and, and uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that veganism is impossible, very deeply entrenched in, in like the small-scale uh, animal farming uh, community. You know, I was a leading proponent for keeping pigs and, and uh, doing animal husbandry, but with a human uh, touch. Well, as our business grew, our farm expanded and our shop started selling more and more meat and eggs and milk. It felt less as I was doing something good for the animals and more and more as I was just showing a happy face for uh, any kind of animal product consumption. It felt like I was a poster boy for, for the animal industry in itself. So I, I, uh, that didn't feel so good, to be honest. So we're picking for the bags, and it's 15 bags. It makes uh, about three kilos, just a little bit extra to be sure. I came across veganism on YouTube, actually, and um, a lot of the things they were saying started to make a lot of sense. The first year or so was really difficult. I made a lot of enemies, unfortunately, because most of my friends were also farmers with animals on their farm. And when I started posting on Facebook that I was a vegan and I was against killing animals and all that stuff, and that wasn't too popular with my farmer friends. <laughs> there were just so many questions also that we had to answer. What are you going to eat instead? It's not easy to make a dietary change, but it's even more difficult to make a change in a farm. Our whole infrastructure, everything we had on the farm, was based around animals. We sold the animals, uh, took down all the fencing, we tore down the animal houses. Uh, and uh, if you don't have animals, you still have to uh, produce something on your farm, obviously. And we put a lot of effort into growing different beans and legumes. There's enormous potential in switching from animal uh, agriculture into vegan agriculture, purely from an efficiency uh, viewpoint. You know, if you grow one hectare of beans and uh, compare that to one hectare of uh, grass for sheep, you will find that the beans produce, I think it's up to 10 times as many calories on the same amount of land animals aren't a very efficient way often to produce food you know you, your food kind of takes a, an extra way through the animal you know you grow grains you give them to the animal and then you eat the animal you lose a lot on the way instead if you grow grains and make that into a product that's eaten directly by humans you know you're just taking a shortcut and, and being more efficient also we're approaching 9 billion people here on the planet. We need to be more efficient with the land we already have. And I think yeah, going into vegan farming, that will be one of the most important steps we can take. I still have friends who have animals. Uh, I don't mind that. There's many places that are not suitable for vegan farming. You can only grow grass there. This is one of them. It's a beautiful place. There's no one model that fits everybody. Uh, different farms have different uh, possibilities and you have to adapt to the way your farm is. And uh, this is uh, yeah, a beautiful place where animals graze. Uh, I like that also. But there should be alternatives. <laughs> 
we're not bound by tradition anymore. You can just, instead of doing like your parents or your neighbors do, Google your way and just find, uh, you know, some guy in New Zealand who's doing a thing and copy that guy instead. Hi, and uh, welcome back to this uh, Game 7 in the match between uh, David Howell and Nils Cornelius. Uh, we've had a couple of moves, uh, but before we go into the position, I just want to mention that we are doing a fundraiser throughout this match with the Norwegian Refugee Council. And our goal is to get to $20,000, and currently we're at 9777 uh -huh. So please... Uh, if you have a chance to, to help us uh, with this great cause, you can see the use the QR code on, on the broadcast. And um, yeah, if you have a chance to, to help, uh, that will be much appreciated. And uh, hopefully, we can can reach our goal of um, of twenty thousand by the end of the match. And uh, the score in the match is three and a half, two and a half for David. Uh, some very interesting fighting games. Uh, but today, Nils has the white pieces, and uh, we'll, we'll probably go for the win. And uh, we saw this uh, interesting Rook A3 move, uh, Mihailo, before the break. And, I mean, Nils is such a well-prepared player. Uh, do you think this is an idea he has had in his uh, notes for this, uh, this opening? Uh, I'm guessing it could have been one of the ideas, but it doesn't seem that necessarily this position uh, was uh, on, on the list given the time they both spent, although Nils has apparently, what, 25-minute advantage. And, um, uh, 
but uh, uh, I, I never seen this kind of position with Rukun H3 before. Uh, I love the idea. I hope it works. And uh, but uh, David just played Rook E8, just a useful move, and saying, "Yeah, I'm, I'm not the one playing for a win. Yeah, I'm leading the yep. match. Uh, I have a solid position. If you wanna bring it on, if you yep. want, if you want to." Uh, uh, to cause me trouble. So, and I'm looking at the position, and yes, this knight has to be on g3 in this position uh, for many reasons. Uh, well, reason number one is not blocking the bishop, right? Bishop on c1 is now sad. All the other pieces are more or less happy. Yeah, so the knight is attacking here, defending this. This knight is defending, like all the pieces are doing something, except maybe with the queen, but queen rarely does anything with the full board of pieces. So bishop on c1 wants to play and nobody lets him play. And all of black's pieces are playing except the rook on a8, but that's uh, rarely the case that both rooks are working. This bishop is attacking a pawn, this bishop is attacking a pawn. Like, uh, you can tell if uh, a piece is well placed. Uh, uh, that's one of the things that, uh, uh, hold on a second, am I discussing it in my initiative course? I don't remember, but uh, uh, yes, I think I am. Uh, so how do you know a piece is good? The, the, the basic principle is uh, if it's attacking at least anything, that's already something, right? If it's putting some even small pressure on your opponent's position, it, it's not a bad piece anymore. So all of these black pieces, one, two, three, four, five, all of them uh, directly or indirectly attack, uh, attack uh, one of white's uh, pawns or pieces, right? So they are putting pressure on white's position. But if you look at the other way around, this bishop is attacking, this knight is attacking. And well, I'm not talking about pawns because you cannot have an active pawn. You can have an active piece, but the pawns are not necessarily active. It would be like advanced pawn. It's like uh, the pawn is too restricted to be active or passive. But the piece, white has only two pieces that cause trouble to black's position. That's not good. All the other pieces are defending or doing not much. So, for example, if this knight was on g3, then this bishop would be attacking the h6 pawn, and we already talked about the possible uh, sacrifices there. Well, black has to watch out. But now you cannot go knight f1, because the pawn on e4, uh, by the way, one of the things that I discussed in my World Champions Blunder course, there's this concept of semi-protected piece, or you can call it whatever you want. That's basically a piece that has the same number of attackers and defenders. One attacker, one defender. That's a loose piece. And after capture, capture, another attacker has joined, and that's it, white loses that poor pawn. So you cannot go knight f1. Again, if you go d5, that's bad from strategical point, uh, because uh, knight goes to e7. And now, official, this bishop on c4 is now officially a bad piece, because there's a wall of pawns in front of its face, right? Uh, this bishop on b6 is, even though there are a wall of pawns there, but it's somewhere there. Not bodies, putting pressure on the pawn on f2, and it's a great bishop. If it was on f8, that would be a bad bishop officially. But that's a good bishop. So it's not, you don't only look at the pawn formations in the center, you look whether they, they are in the way of your bishop or not. And so d5, bad move from strategical point of view. Although you can argue that white can go bishop f1 and then knight c4 and attack that bishop. So for example, if black does something, uh, I don't know, like rook f8, maybe preparing f5. Uh, white goes knight c4, and now this bishop will have some trouble. Uh, where do you move it? Well, probably you move it to c5. Maybe white can get some control play with b4. But that's a risky strategy. With this close center, you can get under, under attack very quickly. Knight g6, knight f4, knight h5. All these pieces are coming at your king, including this bishop. That looks dangerous to me. So I'm trying, it's hard for me to find a move for white. You cannot move the bishop. You cannot move the knight. Cannot move this knight on f3, right? Moving the rook to b3, maybe, yeah, you can, you can say I move the rook to b3 and maybe I want to have like possible exchange sacrifices in, in distant future. But maybe I would focus on putting this knight on c4. But, but you always have to watch out for the d4 pawn because black can take at any moment. You have to always anticipate that. So I don't know what to do here for that. Maybe queen b3, attack the pawn. By the way, a pawn on f7 is now semi-protected. That once the rook left, one attacker, one defender, you should watch out. So queen b3 is not a bad move, but black can go like queen e7, for example, and say, yeah, I defended it. What's next? Now your rook on a3 looks silly. So I really don't know what Mills uh, has prepared here. Maybe he would sacrifice the pawn and, for example, move bishop to a2. 
keeps the bishop on this strong diagonal, and then prepare knight c4. That could be something. And if takes, 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 uh, well, black played a useful move rook e8, white played hardly a useful move bishop a2, but at least white can continue the attack with rook d3, e5, knight f3, rook g3, like white has very strong initiative. So maybe he would go bishop to a2. And, but black doesn't have to take, black can just play some other move. And well, let's say bishop a7, prophylactic, carp of style move. You know knight c4 is coming, you're like, yeah, yeah, okay. Now, but now if you're coming here, the pawn on e4 is left undefended. Remember, it's still, it, now it's semi-protected again, but after capture, and after, like that's it, white loses the pawn. So you cannot move the knight, but with the bishop on b6, maybe white put, you know, like here and take the bishop and that would not be bad at all. So uh, maybe uh, I would expect something like bishop a2. I also think or, um, with, with, with Nils playing rook a3, um, inviting uh, David to take this pawn, even though it's very dangerous for black, I also get the feeling that Nils um, has come prepared today and, and going for the win. He, he might mm. want to sacrifice a pawn. He wants to stay active. He wants to create attacking chances. So I won't be surprised if, if he ends up um, sacrificing a pawn in some of these mm -hmm. variations. But as you say, David can you know play some calm moves. Okay, it's not up to me to prove anything. Uh, I will not take the pawn. I will stay solid. And um, then Nils have to kind of come up with some some new ideas, uh, maybe. And I like your analysis because how Black's pieces are well coordinated and, and they're all, most of the pieces are doing a job, you know, hitting targets. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Well, White is struggling a little bit with both the tension in the center and also uh, to find time to reorganize some of the, the minor pieces in, in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, I forgot to mention one very natural move, which would be five. In the night, trying to expo expose the rook, and now d5 is coming. So I should have started. That. That's the most obvious move in the position. You want to go d5 and then win the rook, right? In an exchange. So black has to go bishop d7, and and now d5 would be somewhat consistent because at least you're getting rid of a bad bishop, right? I told you that the bishop was bad. You may want to exchange it, but now black can take with the knight, and now f5 is basically unstoppable. And this knight can come to c5. I think black has a very good position here. But I can see how this game is like the rook can still join on third rank. Let's say knight goes to c4, then take the bishop, then c4, let's say f5. I take the bishops, let's say pawn. Okay, pawn takes strategically risky. So let's go with the knight. And now we have this weird position. But if black pushes f5, white has no counterplay on the queen side. It's not, nothing is happening there. Black is the one uh, on top here. Uh, so uh, maybe knight to c4 here, not capturing. Maybe that would be his idea. Maybe that would be his idea. I don't know. So he has some uh, uh, stuff to figure out. Is he is he going bishop a2? Is he going bishop b2? Is he going d5? What is he? Is he going queen b3? I don't know. There are many many yeah. moves in this position, but. Uh, for now, the tension is building up. Absolutely. Right? Very often, and the game I see very often the game goes like this. At first, it's quite slow. So we're developing pieces. Maybe one pawn is attacking another pawn. Maybe there's like there's not a single piece attacking each other, right? There are maybe pawns attacking each other. But sometimes you have pieces like pins here. You know, you can imagine a pin here. If I didn't go h3, there sometimes could be pieces attacking other pieces, and the tension builds. And at some point, uh, the <laughs> The tension, uh, ah, a kid wanted to walk in. Um, uh, tension could, uh, will blow up at, that, at some moment. Uh, the tension would be uh, there's some tactics, some, some exchanges, some, uh, some things happening, and then the position comes down again. And then tension builds up again. For now, uh, both players are building up the tension. This rook a3 was an invitation. Come on, let's do this. Take my pawn, let's go. You know, if you take the pawn, I take, take, attack, e5, boom, boom, boom. But Black said, no, no, I'm not ready yet. Let me break the rook. So White can say, uh, um, it's actually up to Black to, like if White takes now, it's Black, let's say, I remember I told you that was a bad knight on c6. So if Black takes with a pawn, Black remains with this horrible knight on c6, which has no place to go. It's completely restricted by this pawn. 
So that's the difference. That's the bad night. We, we talked about bad bishop. We, everybody knows a bad bishop and good bishop, right? But we never talk about good night and bad night. Uh, well, we know what is a good night on an outpost. That's a great night. But what there's no outpost, that's a bad night on C6. It's passive. It's not attacking anything. It's only defending this pawn on E5. And this knight on F3 is active. It's putting pressure on the pawn, even though it's well defended. So black's correct move would be knight takes E5. Trading, for sure, this knight will be traded. And let's say after takes, now take with the pawn. And black says, I'm going to go C6, maybe or maybe not. I have a good bishop. I have a good knight. I have this, like, this is equal. This is equal. And now this rook on H3, now it's officially silly because mm -hmm. white would never go c4 in this position that would be horrible strategical decision we can all discuss so rook will have to come back and maybe actually black would be slightly better because of that so d takes e5 um not not an option for white so yes needs uh, luckily needs had like 15 minutes extra even after uh thinking for now so but he has some strategical choices to be made i think he would go bishop a2 that would be consistent with his previous move right now the rook is ready to join the king side knight c4 is coming but probably he's trying to assess this this position takes 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 and takes so previously the rook was on f8 and the bishop was on c4 the rook was really passive on f8 and now it's uh, an improved version for black how good it is, uh, is it it's hard to say White has rook g3, white has rook d3. So I'm guessing he could be thinking about this position. Let's say rook goes to d3 and then followed by e5. And now we're talking, this is this is a tense position. It's exactly what, uh, not exactly, but similar positions as, uh, not similar from uh, pawn structure wise, but similar from the, the tension in the position. Now it's go time, bishop moves, now it's e5. There mm -hmm. you go, you attack here, there's the pin. And black says, aha, there's the, I'm gonna do this. The rook on e1 does not defend it, you know. Now this is not happening. And white goes knight f3, restoring the threat. And now black takes. Now white takes. That's action, you know. Now you need to get. There's no win. There's no win yet for either side. Black goes bishop to e6. White, let's say, takes, takes. This is still a tense position, but it will come down in a second where white uh, runs out of four sync moves, which is more or less the case now. And white is one pawn down, and I prefer black. So maybe these are the, the moves that are uh, uh that he's considering because if you're gonna go bishop a2 which is totally consistent with rook a3 you have to calculate and assess all of this and it takes a lot of time uh to process that or maybe he's not ready to sacrifice the pawn but then i don't know how do you defend it it's, i don't see how to do it. you have to settle for this or that both gives black an amazing position so i think he may be calculating bishop a2 and trying to see whether his initiative would be enough after uh, clearly prepared uh, capture on the next move. Yeah, and and I feel as you mentioned, uh, if if you play d5 in this position, that's a very committal move, you know. And you invite yeah. Black to kind of change focus back to the king side with this potential mm -hmm. f5 break, and uh, you won't get uh, the rook into the game uh, probably anytime soon. Um, um from a3. Yeah. And, uh, and it's you also made a very good point. If you take on e5, you're helping your opponent with with the worst placed uh, minor piece. Exactly. In the position. Exactly. And, and, and that's also things you have to consider when you're you're, you're playing. Uh, identify your opponent's weak pieces and and try not exactly. to, not to help them get into the exactly. game or, or or exchange them because you don't want to help your opponent. You want to beat your opponent. And uh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so, so some, some some very good strategical points, and and if you play d5, the whole position changes. Uh, it's my feeling, and uh, I also feel black probably is the one who can easiest uh, start to play on the king side with this f5 thematical f f5 move, and um, yeah, yeah, maybe white even has to be a bit uh, careful for yeah. potential and, attack. Uh, you know, another thing about this d5. Whenever you have this kind of pawn structure in the center, which is like King's Indian, like uh, Rui Lopez, you can get this pawn structure from many openings. And uh, uh, usually black spine is f5, undermining the, the last pawn, right, to undermine the whole chain. And for white, the plan is to push c5, to undermine the d6 pawn, like right, to, to create a weak uh, uh, pawn at the end of this, the, the beginning of the pawn chain, not at the end, because at the end it's uh, well supported. And now when, when you include these two moves, it's impossible to push c5, like almost literally it's impossible. 
right? Because you go, you can go, like you can move the bishop, you can go see, you need b4. Once you, like if I had a pawn on a2, then it's possible. You go c4, you go a3, you go b4, you somehow prepare the c5 move. But now even if you have like five moves, it's almost impossible to push c5. And without c5, yeah, you have to go like b4, I guess, but then like just ignores it and like and just focus on the, on the king side in this position. Probably that's a plan too. Bishop moves and knight goes to c4 and white tries to create trouble on the queen side. But black can say, yeah, yeah I don't care. You can take on a5. I move, like, I, I don't care. I'm focusing on the king side. I can just go knight g6, knight h5. Keep moving my knights towards your king or prepare f5. I think d5 would be strategically a very risky decision, but uh, he has to calculate it because he has to do something. Black, uh, I'm afraid Black is already threatening to take this pawn, and I don't know how to deal with that. And um, Igo on the chat is saying mm -hmm. his knight f5 and rook g3 uh, an idea for, for white at some point in, in, in this game. Yes. But uh, you would need a lot of help from your opponent for that to, to happen. You have to let this happen, right? And then let the rook in, like, without Black's help, there's no way. Black has to take and not recapture anything else and let all your pieces in. Yes, that's exactly the idea that he had. Well, it could happen after this. For example, I don't know, white plays some random move like rook b3, let's say. And let's say Black takes, 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 takes. Now it's very real, right? The knight can can come to a fight, the rook can come to g3, then it would be a dangerous attack. That's true. I can, but uh, you cannot do it on your own, right? You yeah. need, like, you cannot go here without the capture, right? You will never go c4 yourself, so you're just waiting for the capture. So that's like a little downside to rook a3 move. You like uh, request help from your opponent. Please yeah. take my pawn, let my rook in, otherwise uh, it's not doing much. I guess that would be some kind of dream dream setup for white, you know, to, to get the rook to g3, uh, knight f5, mm -hmm. we're threatening some uh, sacrifices. No, on h6, that's right. Oh, h6, g7, g7 is uh, mm -hmm. some, some potential targets. But yeah, as you said, you need some help from, from black in this position to, to make it happen. And, uh, yeah, and you know, the, I think the main problem that Nils is facing, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I like to do experiments with the position. So let's say the engine is running and give some weird evaluation that I don't really understand. This is what I do. I'm trying to change the position to see which factor is critical. So I take the same position, but I move one piece to, to a better place. Was that the critical? So here I'm gonna try because now the engine is giving like zeros, but I already prefer black to be honest, uh, because it seems to me that white cannot, this is, there's this, this pawn tension in the center between two pawns. Sometimes it's a one-way tension, meaning that the first si uh, the one who breaks the tension first uh, strategically loses something. I think it's white now. White goes d5. We talked about it. Black gets a great uh, pawn structure. If white takes, 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 black actually even takes with the rook and try to put pressure on this pawn. So white, uh, from strategical point, white cannot capture or push, but black, uh, but black can do both. Black can take or leave it. I think it's slightly in black's favor this tension because it seems that white cannot lose this tension without some strategical losses. But I want to do a test. Let's say I'm going to go knight f1, and I put my knight on g3. Right, same position, but my knight is already on g3. Now white is much better. Now the relation is more than plus one because this bishop is working and the pawn on d4 is defended. So uh, the, the reason why uh, Nils is not having an advantage because he may have pushed d4 too early. First, they move the knight on g3 uh, and then push d4. There's a reason for it because now it's too late. Or maybe he could have played d4 after Black's knight was on g6, right? Then it would be there would be no pawn on d4 to defend. So if white puts the knight on g3, white has big advantage. Now, why does the typical uh, bishop goes to b1 or c2? And bishop e3, queen d2, we've seen this today, right? The bishop goes here to support the pawn on e4. And bishop e3, queen d2, typical, and take on h6. That's a winning plan for white. But knight cannot jump to g3. And that's this. And that is the point, I think. Mm -hmm. One of the CNN correspondents has this. And that is the point. I wish like one or two. <laughs> so the, the knight on d2, now, the, now uh, I told you that knight on c6 was a bad piece. After I push d4, that's a great piece now. 
because it's attacking. As the pawn on d3, it's a passive piece that doesn't do anything. The moment white push d4, the knight on c6 is like, yay, I have stuff to do. I have yeah. something to attack or capture. Now you should you should worry about your position. So it finally has a purpose on, on c6. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. And finally uh, attacking stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I feel we're at a critical switch. critical point now in this game, and and uh, White's next move will kind of uh, tell us how how uh, the continuation will will be or um, what he's aiming for. And um, yeah, we have yeah we looked at some different options: d5, take on e5, bishop a2, queen b3. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess we're expecting maybe uh, move the bishop, as you pointed out. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Nils, uh, like, uh, first of all, I, um, uh, uh, both players are motivated to win the game financially, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's better to win and lose, lose and win, than two draws, right? Is that correct? Yeah, correct. So I can just uh, quickly mention, so the, the organizers of this match, uh, the, the prize uh, fund system is like uh, the players get 1,500 pounds per, per win, which is a lot of money for winning one chess game. And uh, mm -hmm. if you draw, both players will get 500 pounds. And uh, if you lose, unfortunately, you will get nothing. So uh, they're hoping to, to see some fighting chess and uh, that the players will, will go for the win in, in each game. And uh, mm -hmm. I have to say, even though we had many draws in this match, all the games have been really exciting. And uh, there have been some missed uh, opportunities from, uh, from both players not able to convert uh, advantages. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I like this. Um, I like this uh, incentive uh, prize fund, uh, and uh, I think it's uh, yeah, it's uh, encouraging uh, the players to play for for the win. I think uh, that's why uh, the reason I mentioned that. I think so. Nils knows that David wants to win, right? He's like uh, he, whenever he gets a chance to to have a, a full fighting game, he has one point ahead, right? So he has uh, he can risk it, although. Yeah, the winner doesn't get anything. So yes, it's for on game to game basis. So I think uh, consistent with the rules of this match would be Bishop A2 move. Consistent with what he's done before, inviting this capture. Invite, let's go, let's do this. Let's mm -hmm. have a fist fight in the middle of the board. I'm sacrificing the pawn. Uh, otherwise, my next move is, let's say if black does nothing, uh, let's say Bishop D7, white goes Bishop to B1. And let's say black still doesn't capture, I don't know, queen e7 or something. Now white has knight c4 idea, bothering this bishop. And white has the knight f1 idea, because the bishop is supporting the pawn and knight is coming to g3, right? So if white goes bishop to a2, and that's exactly what happened, yeah? While I was talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, Nils played bishop a2, inviting, and I'm, I'm ready to go knight c4. I'm ready to go bishop b1. Let's do this. And... Uh, hold on a second. What is the time on the clock? Do I have the correct time on the clock? One hour for Nils, 20 minutes for David Howell, or is that let's not uh, let's uh, see? Uh, I mean, I'm, I will not be surprised if that's correct because David often spends a lot of time. Um, because I just opened the the live transmission, and it says that Neil spent to, to less than a minute on Bishop A2, and it was actually David who was thinking for like one oh. hour on okay, the last so three moves. Probably some delay uh, in the transmission. Mm -hmm. okay, so David is under 20 minutes. Uh, ah, then it's definitely Neil's, uh, part of Neil's preparation. Maybe yeah. one word, because he has, or he definitely seen similar ideas in his analysis, maybe not necessarily this position, or maybe he didn't prepare this position exactly for the game and it took him some time to, uh, to recall uh, his own analysis. So yes, that's an open invitation to a fist fight. Oh yeah, we might get some action now if, uh, if David takes on d4. Do you suspect or expect he's taking or is there other more solid uh, moves he can, he can play? I don't see a useful move for black. With bishop on c4, previously, by the way, instead of rook e8, there was this option to take, take and push d5 and go to an isolated pawn position, takes, takes. But now the rook will, will join the attack and black will be in trouble, like knight e4, or so, like that looks very dangerous to me. 
So uh, because the rook is fully participating in the game. So the game continued rook to e8. Now this, I don't see a useful move. Like what is the useful move for black except the catch? Because white has useful moves. I can push e5, I can push d5 now because that would not be the same pushing e5 because the white controls the same. White has neither, like white has, been, white has many useful moves. It's black's turn to act. And they're like now d5 is terrible because white goes e5. Yeah, there's no this more looks, uh, looks unpleasant. And that would be a, that would be a checkmate soon. There should be one knight f1 and g. That's a horrible position for black. So I think he doesn't have a choice except take. But now the question is, does Nils take, take and go rook d3 or does he go knight c4? But the bottom line is uh, similar. Uh, now the position is completely open and tense, right? There's tension here, there's tension here. E5 is coming, rook d3. White has a bunch of forcing moves. A lot of, like there's capture, there's knight c4, there's rook d3, or oh, uh, there's e5. White has a, suddenly, in, in one second, the, the nature of the position turned upside down. The position is extremely tense. Now there's a lot to calculate, but the approximate algorithm that, that I uh, suggest in my course about the initiative, number one priority are forcing moves. It's not rocket science. Just consider forcing attacking moves first. In this case, the two and ideally you want to choose a forcing move that improves your position, right? Not just attack something for no good reason. Improve one of your pieces as you attack something. In this case, that would be, let's say, take stakes. And now you go rook d3. That's a major improvement of the rook. Because rook on a3, which is just standing there, just with good potential, nothing. But now the rook is attacking the bishop and looking at the eye rolling, the, the queen on d8. And next move is e5. And boy, black has to be careful here. e5, I think we checked this position. And black has to go queen e7 using the rook on e1 so white cannot capture. But it's not a difficult move to play, I would say, queen e7 on, on, the, on that level. And white goes knight f Ah, we checked this one. Takes. And let's say rook takes, bishop goes here, takes, takes. And now white more or less ran out of forcing moves. And black has, has an extra pawn, and but white has compensation. That's because of all the pieces are active now. And black has only one active piece, which is the bishop. So that's why it's approximately equal. But white doesn't have to go rook d3 here. White doesn't have, white can go knight c4, buzzers his bishop and attack here. And on takes, use the rook. Not the queen, because the queen will block the rook. And now, oof, I don't know, bishop h6, e5, knight b6. Oh my god, um, I'm afraid for, for David's position. All of white's pieces are suddenly, I look at every single white's piece, every single piece. Knight is attacking, rook is attacking, the bishop is attacking, the queen is attacking. Okay, the rook on e1 is potentially attacking, bishop on a2 is potentially attacking. All of white's pieces are active. And black has three active pieces, one, two, three. Maybe this bishop, but the rook on a8 is completely not participating. And uh, I think Niels would have a great initiative here. Black shouldn't lose this bishop, so black has to go bishop c5. And now it can launch the attack with e5. Probably black will be okay here because the queens may get exchanged. Takes, takes, might take c5. And again, bishop to e6. Maybe. And now white is one pawn down without queens. Ah, but then one more, one move deeper. Semi-protected pieces. I already mentioned this several times. One attacker, one defender. They are in bigger, like there are unprotected pieces in black's position. One, two, three, four, right? Four pieces and pawns are not defended. Usually people focus only on those. But the reality is that there are semi-protected pieces, and I discussed it in my uh, World Champions Blunder course, that are in bigger danger than undefended pieces. Knight on f6 has one attacker, one defender. So does the pawn on h6. One attacker, one defender. The problem is that these two pieces have the same defender. So I can go ahead and take this pawn and try to distract this, and now more pawns are falling, and black is in trouble. Luckily, this isn't checkers. Black can play some other move, like uh, like almost any other move. And but white restores the balance, and uh, white has a better pawn structure and active pieces. 
but these are the lines that they both should be calculating. But, but I have to say, I mean, important. a great analysis. Uh, but I, I, I think I prefer knight c4 in this position compared to taking on d4, the, the last line. Mm -hmm. of I think that yeah. that's more a bit more flexible. Yeah, knight c4. Because the other line was a bit forced, and it looks like black is holding on somehow. Mm -hmm. But with knight c4 immediately, uh, I think it yeah. might... Because this knight is not active, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they're also like opening up for the bishop on c1 and like has yeah. to take, take, rook takes because you can... yeah. uh, I have slight problems with the connection. You let me know if you see any trouble. Uh, yeah, I'm also expecting knight to c4. Also expecting knight to c4, but this has a lot, a lot of time on his clock to process. All his, um, all his different options, but the top priority should be forcing moves that improve your position. Mm -hmm. Most of the capture and knight c4 create an immediate threat, and black has to deal. Any other move uh, loses the momentum, loses the momentum because black wants to develop the bishop and neutralize this active piece and exchange some pieces and say I have an extra pawn. Yeah, and also, I mean, in general, uh, if you have sacrificed material, you have to find uh, new threats or come up with active moves to keep the initiative. Because if you if you sleep for one move, often your opponent will have time to to solidify the position and just be one pawn up or exchange up. Or so, yeah, that's a great advice. You have to keep uh, keep finding active moves and threats. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's all about the initiative, right? After you you sacrifice something. Uh, yeah, I really yeah. like it. it's nice for it's all I think. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I'm a bit worried now for the first time in the match with David's uh, time time handling, because one thing is to have time trouble in in an easy position, you know, many. Many moves, many options you can play, uh, and this might turn into uh, a complex position where he has to be accurate and, and play very precisely. Mm -hmm. And he's down to fifteen minutes, and they only played what 14, 14 moves. So um, yeah, fifteen minutes plus increment for uh, twenty six moves for for David. So that's. Uh... <laughs> That's a bit uh, bit uh, tricky, but uh, obviously he's used to being low on time, and he's a great player in time trouble. But yeah, you never know; uh, can be uh, can be difficult. How are you in in time trouble uh, in in classical chess? Do you get stressed, or or do you manage? That's to... a good. <laughs> that is a good question. Uh, I. Uh... I like, I'm also, except uh, I'm also a mathematician and I love mathematics and logic. So, for example, I'll give you an advice what I'm trying to use during my own games when I'm approaching time trouble. So, for example, now David has 15 minutes, right? And it's move 14. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. So he has 25 more moves to go approximately, right? In 15 minutes. How many seconds per move is that? That's less than maybe 40 seconds per move plus 30 seconds extra. So mm -hmm. one minute, 10 seconds. That's an average time he can spend to, to not lose on time. So it doesn't mean that he can spend two or three minutes per move. He should stick to one, uh, less, uh, one minute per move, mm -hmm. even less. Than, okay, maybe a little more because of 30 seconds. But bear in mind, one minute per move, not three, not two, one is your number. But uh, what does it mean? It means that if the position is calm and slow, you should play faster because it doesn't really matter what you do now. But if there's lots of calculation, lots of tension, you should spend more time, right? So it doesn't mean that you should spend one minute all the time. If the position is slow, there's no threats, play it quickly. And if the position is action, you can spend more than that because you may just lose in one move. 
So uh, that's the mess I'm doing on, on the background when I'm approaching time. All right, approximately one minute per move. Okay, and I'm writing down time to, to try to stick to that uh, schedule. And uh, okay, and the game continued, takes, takes and rook d3. So Candidus went with very, very straightforward attack. And e5 is going to come next. E5 no, but that's that's, uh, that's an interesting advice because I think for myself and probably many other players and, and viewers watching, um, we don't have necessarily the same mathematical approach to time trouble. You just know that <laughs> you just know that you're low on time, but you don't know. Okay, I have one minute average per move, and I should stick to that. So it's more like a. Obviously, you see you're low on time, but. Um, for me, uh, for example, I don't I don't do the math part of it. I just uh, know that I'm I'm in time trouble. But I often get stressed when I'm low on time in classical chess. So that's something I'm trying to work on. But um, I'm I'm mm. I, I'm a good blitz player and even bullet player. So it, it's a bit strange because when I'm low on time in classical chess, I, I get stressed. But I never get stressed, you know, if it's a blitz game or a bullet game. So, so that's also an interesting uh, dynamic. Um. Hmm. That is interesting. I, I would maybe suggest that playing uh, with increments online uh, mm -hmm. uh, is much better than without, because I don't know any serious tournament where there's no increment. Yeah. There's always increment. In classical, rapid, blitz, the only way there's no increment is when there's a knockout tournament. And you go all the way to Armageddon. Yep. <laughs> it's like it never happens. I never had an Armageddon in my life. So yep. training yourself to play well without increment is useless. Yeah, close to yeah. zero is different. So playing with increment and trying your best to not win on time but play strong moves, because that's exactly the skill you want to have when you are in time trouble, right? Yep. Play good, decent moves quickly. Uh, not Absolutely. any move quickly, but decent uh, move uh, quickly. Yeah, that's a very, very good advice. Advice, and um, yeah, I've never played the Armageddon either, <laughs> either online or over the board. So yeah, it it rarely happens. So I think that's a great, a great advice uh, in general for for me and all the all the viewers as well. Okay, so we have Rook D three, and um, yeah, we looked at this line. The only thing, I mean, it, it, it looks okay for white, but I just felt the knight c4, uh, you had a bit more flexibility in the position. Um, because in this, in this line, it looks like black is doing okay, because at some point, white is running out of uh, threatening moves, it seemed like, after bishop e6 in this long variation. Um, but still some initiative. Uh, it's here. actually not bishop b6. It's bishop c5 only because you want to have this option. Want to have this option, and you don't want to. If you go to b6, you don't want to run into knight c4 with the tempo. You don't want to mm -hmm. have that. So it's actually only bishop c5 is good. And only so um, the good question would be when do you stop and assess, evaluate the position? I don't think you can stop here. When your opponent runs out of forcing moves then it's a good stopping point. So uh, the end would be here, 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 here. And here, I would evaluate the position for black, not for white. For black, I would be like, okay, I don't see any big threats now, right? Uh, more or less, everything is defended. I have an extra pawn and uh, I can stop here. But you cannot stop here and say, oh, it looks good. No, because there's e5 move. There's e5 move and this is hanging. Knight is coming and they've said like, you cannot stop here. Only when the position comes down at least a little bit, you can say, okay, that looks fine to me. Otherwise you have to keep going. So I'm wondering why is David thinking Does he have yeah. any other move? Or maybe he wants to go to a7. Maybe he's considered to go to stay away from any attacks whatsoever. Maybe he's considering bishop to a7. Because bishop to b6 is not good. Just for human, for like 
I don't want a knight c4 come with a tempo. That's it. I'm dropping that move. Bishop e5, maybe he also considered. Yeah. And um, do you play a knight f3 or in this position, I guess? Because if you play knight c4. Um... Uh, I think I would go knight c4 yeah. and f4. Yeah. yeah. So the, the problem is a bishop ne almost never feel comfortable in the very center. The knight does. Like if you put a knight in the center, it feels very comfortable because if it's attacked, it can jump and then come back. There's no problem. But if the bishop, like if fight goes f4, that traps the bishop right on the spot. Yeah. If that was a knight on e5, the knight is laughing into that pawn space. It can go anywhere. But the bishop, does, so the bishop feels very uncomfortable in the middle of the board. The bishop feels comfortable on a7 where nobody is bothering the bishop. It's attacking. That's where the bishop Feels, feels. I'm talking if it's alive, but I think knight, knight bishop e5 is not good because of something like this, and f4, and I don't see a, a good defense from it. Yeah, so all the fun begins right now. And now David has is very low on time, I think. Yeah, and he's spending. He did not do his math. He's already spent six minutes if if I were to believe the live transmission, maybe it's not always uh, showing the right time. He spent six minutes out of 15. That's really bad mess. Yeah, so if, if this, uh, uh, this is the mess I like to do, he's going to play two and a half moves and run out of time. That's really bad. That's why I'm, I'm uh, talking calculate average time per move, which is one minute, not three, not six, one and tried sticking to it. Clearly, he's calculating lots of variations because whites... And that's exactly the moment where you want to have more time because there's a lot to calculate. Mm -hmm. When the position is still slow, it's better to play it quickly yeah. because the price of the mistake, that's what I'm talking about in the initiative course, the price of your mistake, if you play second, third, fourth best move of the position in a closed position, it's very little. In open position, it could be difference between win and loss, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in open dynamic, uh, stressful position like this one. In closed position, when you're still maneuvering, it really doesn't matter. Just turn on your engine and you would see it. the evaluation is approximately the same for all the moves. Just do one, do one of them, doesn't matter. But here, the difference between first move and second and third is enormous. That's when you wanna invest your time. Unfortunately, David, David doesn't have one. So I think if I were to bet, I would bet on Mills here. Mm. Even though the engine finds some correct moves, but uh, it's much easier to play for white. Bishop a7, yeah. Okay. That I, was about, I was about worse. to ask if, if, if it's um, easier to defend David spending more minutes now because it's a very critical moment in the position, or would it still try and, and spend one minute per move, even though you know it's a very, yeah, committal and, and, and tricky part of, of, the, of the game. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say this, that spending half of your time is justified only if all the options are losing. Mm -hmm. Right. If you don't see like everything seems to be losing, then you you keep looking until you find that that move. In this case, Black had several moves that were not losing. It's Bishop A7. That was Bishop C5. Even C5 was good. Like any of these moves, even if you don't pick the best ones in one or two minutes, is better than half of your time. Even if you find the best move in the position, in half of your time, you're gonna find two best moves and run out of time. Just that mess. So find a move that is not losing and play it quicker than just trying to find the best move in the position. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, average time per move. He spent half of his time on one move. And the fight hasn't even started yet, right? It's not like white already, like white can go e5, white can go uh, rook g3, white can go knight c4. Uh, I, I think he would go e5 in this position because that's the most consistent with what he's been doing. But half mm -hmm. of his time on one move, unless everything is losing. Then yes, then you, you can spend all the time because otherwise you're going to resign. But it's never justified. Half of your time. And he spent half of his time on this move. 
but it's easy to be smart in sitting in a quiet room, not playing there. But maybe uh, this could be something to to think about during uh, our listeners' next time travel. Just yeah. at least give an approximate number of average time per move. Is it one minute? Is it five? What is it? It's definitely not seven that he spent here, right? So you're like you don't have to count the seconds. Just is it one or two minutes? What is it? Less than one minute? Between one and two? Like give an approximate number and try sticking to it. Unless you're losing, unless you don't. But otherwise, yeah, just that move looks reasonable. Calculate a little bit. Let's do this because uh, even if you find the best move now, you will run out of time three moves from now. And the position is not going to be calm in three moves after after this. So. I like Neil's chances here, even though the engine gives zero or whatever the number is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, very well said. And uh, I mean, th they are human players after all, so it's not easy to to play like a computer. Um, we will approach uh, a, a short break. And uh, Mihailo, it's been so uh, great to have you joining me uh, today. And after the break, we will be joined by international master uh, from Norway, uh, Tor Fredrik Kosen. And I just want to remind everyone, once again, today we have sales on Mihailo's brilliant uh, chessable courses, World Champions Blunder, and the initiative in chess, a how-to guide. So please check those out and get a good uh, offer uh, on them today. And uh, yeah, once again, it's been, it's been so uh, instructive. Uh, the chat fun. has been loving you, uh, your analysis, your commentary. Uh, it's been, uh, been a great experience. And yeah. Um, Hope to hope to see you see you again soon. Thank you so much, and uh, don't forget about the donation goal that, yeah, that you set. For absolutely, this, uh, absolutely. Please donate, donate first, and then buy the course if, yeah. uh, if you want to. Do <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Yeah, so thank you again very much, and uh, we'll have a short break, and uh, we'll be back with uh, Tor Frederick in a few minutes. Take care. Goodbye. See you. Bye bye. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have more than 120 million monthly active users and more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything, so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Passion, he created Minecraft and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies, uh, which was amazing and 
more or less unheard of in the like the indie game scene. We believed that we had peaked, but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. When I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we were on a holiday in Singapore, and they have these amazing plants that grow on the trees, like flowers. And I was thinking, oh, that we could use that. <laughs> like, Sweden might be a good place uh, to be a nerd. <laughs> well, we have these really long, dark winters, uh, so it's not strange if anyone just stays indoors a whole weekend and working on something on their computers. That's potentially one of the reasons why we have so many good music artists uh, and also game developers, and we're, we have the time to really geek out on specific topics. Så vi har ju precis snapshotat lite olika features till Kivs och Klivs, till exempel koppar. Och vi har fått in lite olika feedback, så jag tänkte kolla lite med dig vad du tänker. Today I'm more guiding and directing ideas. And uh, Agnes Larsson is now leading the design team for Minecraft. We know that kids play a lot of Minecraft. So when we add new features, we try to consider if we can make this feature in a way that teaches them something. One of the reasons why we added bees was to put attention to that bees are very important for pollination, but also for the way we produce food. And also, Minecraft is a fancy world. And not everything works as it does in real life, obviously. <laughs> When I play Minecraft with my son, I build things and my son, he wants to go on an adventure. <laughs> so he just says, come on dad, come on dad, we need to go. And I was like, okay, I'll follow you. When we're out exploring, I'm more like, oh, can we go back now? <laughs> can, we, can we continue building on, on the castle instead? <laughs> and he's like, no, no dad. <laughs> I'm always thinking about what I'm working on next. <laughs> You never really sit down and say, oh, this is it. It never really ends. <laughs> you just follow your drive.
thanks to Mihailo uh, for joining us earlier in the broadcast. Uh, gave us some great insight. Uh, make sure to check out his uh, fantastic courses on Chessable. And now I want to introduce our uh, our new co-commentator, uh, international master uh, Tori Fredrik Kosen from Norway. Welcome. Thank you so much. Hi. 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 And um, yeah, Tor Frederick, uh, I hope you have uh, catched up with the, with the game. Uh, what are your thoughts on on this position? Yeah. So the position now is of course very sharp. Uh, I think this is a very critical moment um, as. Nils has quite a promising position, but also has a time advantage. Uh, so I now think that Nils is really trying to use his time advantage and think really deeply and to come up with a really smart way to play this position. It looks very dangerous for David here. Uh, yeah, so. absolutely. And, and uh, it's a reoccurring theme in the match, but, but David always seems to come in, in time trouble. Uh, but uh, in some of the other games, the position hasn't been that complicated, mm. and uh, and David has managed to, to play with with uh, low time on the clock. Um, but in this game, uh, we still have 23 moves to make, and mm. uh, he is down to eight minutes. Uh, this might be the first game of the match where he where he actually struggles quite a bit in in mm. time trouble. And uh, yes. do you like Nils's idea now of taking time? making sure to, to calculate well uh, and not play fast himself mm. to push on the clock? Or what would you do in this position as well? Yes. So um, I think what Nils is doing is really smart. Uh, like I, I myself, often I get quite a time, time advantage. And often before I used to play very fast, mm -hmm. but, but often then the quality of the moves goes down and it is like yourself is in the time trouble. Uh, so I really think it makes sense for him to look quite deep. Uh, and what I think is really smart to do is like to look very deep and then to maybe play maybe two moves fast. Like you, you, you have seen a, a bit further than your opponent. And then when you surprise him on the second or third move, then he can be uh, really shocked. And um, like when I think about time trouble players, the first that comes to mind is Grishuk and then David Howell. Like, yeah. uh, like I've heard that he's often in time troubles so uh, i'm sure he's used to this uh, situation but at, at the same time this position is really hard to play and uh, like everyone just plays uh, worse when when i have little time on the clock so it's uh, looking quite hard now for david but i really like what nils is doing uh, i i think that he's going to think for at least five more minutes here and to try to think so that makes a lot of sense and uh, i mean also David is leading the match. Um, obviously, they get uh, great uh, prize money for each game. Mm. But obviously, there's a lot of uh, honor at stake as well. You want to win the match and, yes. uh, and also win some, some, some good money with those uh, victories. And I really like Nils today going, going for the win. You know, he sacrificed a pawn for, for some activity. And... Uh, uh, me and Mihailo uh, was a bit uh, surprised that David actually took the pawn because it seemed like he could just uh, remain solid, uh, play some uh, some calm uh, mm. uh, moves, and 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 this rook on a3 in some variations uh, it was just standing uh, on 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 a3, and uh, now it's suddenly a part of uh, White's attack. And, yes. Uh, yeah, so this line we actually looked at before the break, uh, mm -hmm. e5, queen e7. Yeah, look, like the way that Nils has played this game just shows maybe why the Italian is quite popular nowadays. Uh, as the positions, they are so rich and uh, it's impossible to uh, analyze every, everything, yes? So like yeah, it can lead to very creative and new po positions. This a4 and rook a3, rook to d3. Uh, like I've never seen a rook there, like in this specific way, and it's a very uh, unusual position. So, um, so okay, queen e7. So the point is, of course, that if we now take the knight on f6, then the rook on e1 is falling. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of of course, Nils is not going to take the knight on on f6 now. Um, so the first thing that will come to my mind in, in this position is to play knight to f, f3 to in, include a piece more into the game. Uh, 
here um like you always have to bring more pieces yeah to to bring the checkmate but uh okay so then i guess uh, he's forced to go d takes e e5 as now the rook is protected on on e1 by the knight on f3 d takes e5 and then it's it's a question what to take back with here i i think both knight takes and rook takes e5 seems possible what do you think here um yeah i agree with you i mean Rook takes makes uh, some sense to 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 attack the queen, uh, put mm. some put some pressure in the e file. While taking with the knight, you gain some more uh, pressure on f7. Yes, and, uh, I <laughs> I suspect in either case, black has to play bishop e6 maybe, um, and then we get this possibly we get this uh, very weak pawn for black on e6. Yes, and, and White can say I have a lot of compensation, a uh, bit more active pieces, and um, I feel somehow I feel this position uh, is similar to to many of the other games in this match, where uh, either um, one of the players are a pawn up, but it's a very bad pawn, <laughs> like like what can <laughs> happen in this game, or or the opponent has the bishop pair, a sufficient compensation, and then. Uh, it could be a draw in the end, but I, I also like uh, Nils's uh, chances here. Uh, yeah, so we might get a position like this. Yes, and this but, uh, pawn, mm. and this pawn will forever be weak. I think. Yes, um, like it's here. Like uh, black is a pawn up when we count the material, but this pawn is obviously a target, uh, and like white also has compensation here. But the question is, like, does white have it? anything more like maybe it's just compensation and e equality but uh, like the position seemed a bit more dangerous for uh, for david a few moves ago like yes yeah, this pawn is weak but it also gives some squares yeah so yeah yeah and also now it feels like uh, white is losing some momentum in the attack yes now it's more about comp sufficient compensation yeah. rather than a very dangerous attack uh, mm. so i think david will be quite happy if this happens Mm. But it seems now to me that they maybe played something else on, on the library that Nils played rook g3, it seems to me. Uh -huh. Interesting. On, on, on the library. So we have rook to g3 and d takes e5 on the board here. All right. So he yeah. sacrifices another pawn. Yes. This is a very, very committal, committal move, uh, it seems. Yes. Now, um, now it's like all, all or nothing. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. either Nils crashes through uh, Davis like time trouble will prove too hard and Nils wins or maybe uh, like David will survive maybe actually be doing quite well and and can survive but still I I think just it's more easy to to be right there to have the initiative and it seems like many tempting options there for Nils I think yeah, uh, I mean, the first thing you look at uh, with the rook on g3 is um... Uh, to to bring the bishop into the game on c1, I guess. So move the knight to target yes. uh, h6. Uh, uh, yes, maybe knight to c4, maybe it makes sense to hit the e5 pawn with mm -hmm. tempo, maybe. And now possibly you're also threatening bishop takes h6. Yes, so you're threatening bishop takes h6 H also. Uh, like if now your knight comes to... Uh, uh, to e5 at some point the f7 square will be very weak um, and so this this looks very dangerous for black let's say if black play like king h8 maybe uh, then I, I think knight takes e5 sh should be quite good there with the point that if bishop to e6 I, I think we can just take on e6 yeah. and it's hard to recapture if you take with the queen maybe knight to g6 uh, the cover check and then take the queen could be quite strong um, yeah, absolutely. This um, looks, uh, yeah, this looks dangerous for for black. And, yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, we had a question from um, from the chat. Roger says, "If you have thought that if Nils, I would have thought that if Nils can see any good move, you do it quickly rather than your opponent use your time for his own thinking." Mm. And um, yeah, I mean that's a good point. But maybe as you said, for Frederick, uh, we now will see Nils play the next couple of moves quite fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and then try and surprise David uh, yes. later, later in the variation. Um, yes. 
I um, once I am um, I, I was talking to a friend uh, who is also a very strong chess player, and he was playing against the grandmaster. Uh, my friend was in a severe time trouble, and his grandmaster opponent had like one hour on on his clock, and the, the grandmaster was just thinking and thinking, and uh, like my friend, he was uh, like also thinking during his time, but. Like finally, when the grandmaster made a move, he was completely exhausted from just looking at all the possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so so it's also good if your opponent gets gets really tired from looking at all the possibilities. Uh, also, yeah. it's quite nerve wracking, yeah, to look at all the Absolutely. possibilities. Yeah, around. that's that's a very good point. And uh, yeah. I would say this is a fairly complex position because yes. uh, as black, you have to look at different ways to to uh, defend against uh, the various uh, threats and. Uh, yes. And it's very committal now because you have sacrificed two pawns. You need to prove that, okay, I have some, some compensation. I have some attacking chances. So now it's up to white to kind of uh, show something. Yes. And like we, uh, like after rook to g, g3, uh, it was expected for David to, to go d takes e, e5. So Nils for sure has looked at, at this yeah. uh, thinking. So uh, I. Mm -hmm. And we looked at knight c4, but. Maybe also knight e4 is some option here. Yes, knight, knight e, e4 is also a poss possibility. The reason why it doesn't feel as natural as knight to c4 is, is that now we are not attacking the, the e5 pawn as, as much, but it has other uh, advantages. Yes, So maybe knight e, e4 is just as strong as uh, knight to c4. It would be um, an option. Yeah, and, and, and also, I guess one point is that Maybe, maybe you can also bring, if, if knight takes, then you can bring this rook into the game as well in some lines. Uh, not immediately, maybe, but uh, you would dream to kind of double the rooks. Uh, wow. G3, <laughs> G4. And now it's even more dangerous. Uh, if you also bring the queen to H5, then you really start to to build up uh, wow. a promising attack. Yes, uh, like e, e, imagine this, if bishop to E6, maybe it's Strong here to go rook e g4, maybe. <laughs> yeah, crazy move. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> this looks uh, very, very scary for uh, wow. for black. Um, and like this, bishop on, on, on a2 is surely worth more than a rook here. Like, it's extremely yeah. strong here on a2. Like, if, like, I'm sure if you take on g4 after queen takes g4, it, it should probably just be mate very soon here on. And you g7. can't play g6, you know? That's the whole. Oh. Then, then we can take, and this bishop is very strong on this long the diagonal and mate soon on g7. So, um, in f8, you can take uh, on h6 with the bishop. That's a nice yes. checkmate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, here, yeah, or no, if um, if you play g6, here, yeah, no, uh, sorry, after bishop takes g4, queen takes g4, and uh -huh. then g6. So, just to show this very nice uh, checkmate, uh, yeah, g6. Take mm -hmm. and then king f8. Ah, uh -huh. yes. And then you, yeah, can, yes. you can mate in different ways, but bishop takes uh, h6 is very nice. Like it is the triumph of the attack, yeah. Like all the pieces are playing, and yeah, all, all of these pieces are not playing. So it's and that's really what you're difficult. dreaming of when you're attacking. And I think a very general and good advice when you're attacking, you need to uh, you need the pieces to to work together. Or yes. Yes. Pieces. And you have to bring invite everyone to the party. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it is like uh, like Paul Morphy said, like you have to help your pieces so that the pieces can can help you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It it sounds a bit cheesy, but but it's actually very true. And uh, like yep. I often think of this while I am attacking. So. It's, um, and when I have looked at some of my best uh, attacking games, uh, at least eighty percent of my pieces are has a has a. Uh, a job to do in in the attack and uh, yes. and black has to be careful because white only needs a few moves before all the pieces are actually doing a great job uh, in the yes. attack. And I go in the chat says this looks like it could be a Morphe game and uh, yeah I mean according to the computer I I'm sure uh, black has uh, some some way to defend this position but with mm -hmm. seven minutes on the clock and. Uh, some some very serious attack yes and it, it's not easy from a human perspective and uh and obviously you didn't have computers uh when morphe uh, played yeah, yes so, no, um, i'm a big morphe fan myself i 
I actually think, if I'm not mistaken, that Paul Morphy was one of the first players that in, in produced the rook lift, like the oh. rook lift. I, I, I think so. But okay, he he played it in in an uh, odds game, like when he was started with a piece down. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, maybe I could be mistaken, but I I think I've seen in a game where he played the rook lift, so it definitely could be a Morphy game. This. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the games I, I, I like to show uh, beginners to chess is this very famous Paul Murphy game, you know, uh, called One Night at the Opera, where he's checkmating yes. his opponent, sacrificing all his pieces. Uh, so for those of you um, watching this broadcast, and if you haven't looked at that game, you should definitely check it out. I think it's from 1858 or 1859. When he had this famous uh, Euro uh, trip, he was touring Europe and playing uh, different um, different players uh, in Europe. So um, yeah, definitely check out um, that game of uh, Paul Murphy. Looks like to Frederick froze for a minute. Let's see if he if he gets back in. Yeah. All right, we're back. Um, had some small technical difficulties, but we're back. And yeah, as Igo says in chat, it was Morphe versus uh, uh, the Duke. Yeah. Yes, the Duke. Yeah. Yes. I think it's 1858 or might yeah 1858 or 59. Uh, and I think he he won every single game on this European tour uh, he had, and he was kind of crowned the unofficial world champion. Uh, yes. Um, Obviously, the first official match was in 1886 when um, when we had the first world champion. But yeah, Murphy. Uh, yeah. Even, even players like Bobby Fischer said that Paul Murphy is probably one of the greatest chess players of all time. Yes, it's uh, very so, cool. So it's definitely worth to to check out uh, his games. Yes. So I I really think what you can learn from watching Murphy's games is really how to uh, get like the uh, how to use your pieces in, in the most effective way and, and how to get them uh, working together in the best possible matter. Uh, he was a master at getting his attack flowing. And uh, yes, he he has played really a lot of masterpieces. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and would you say like Mikael Tal had a similar style just 100 years later than, uh, than Murphy? Uh, also known for his attacking chess and sacrificing and very romantic style of chess, I would say. Yes, like the Mikhail Tal in the 1958, 59, and 1960s uh, were like sort of a modern Morphe in to to that time. Like it was thought that uh, the old Morphe era, yeah, was like uh, uh, now it's uh, solid and this, but he proved that also modern chess can be in this old romantic way. Uh, so yes, that. I I think it's good to compare Tal with 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 Morphe also, so uh, very creative and uh, so many new and interesting ideas. So definitely. absolutely. And uh, I think we have a move. Uh, David played King F8. Um, okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Yes. So uh, I, did, I did not mm -hmm. expect this move. Uh, what's no. your assessment now to it? Yeah, so um, it looks uh, okay. I think the idea is is that after now knight takes e5, at least the bishop is not as deadly on on the a2 diagonal. Like it's not in in this pin directly towards the king, uh, and but it feels a bit unnatural this this move. Like it's not so often that you see it, uh, but okay, it is what we now say in modern chess. Like if it works, it works. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it, it is depending if. Uh, Niels has something con 
Crete now. Okay, so uh, the first move I will be thinking about here is knight takes e, e5, just bringing the knight in into the game. Um, it does not seem like bishop to e6 here works due to the same tactic, bishop takes e, e6, and you can't uh, take with, with the pawn now as knight to g6 forks the king and queen. Uh, also, queen takes should fail due to knight to g6 check also. So it means that uh, David is basing his position here uh, upon some, something else uh, than, than bishop to e6. So, um, I mean, this is this is very double-edged, and uh, I think the um, the computer will find some very interesting ideas for for both players. Uh, yes. Also, some sacrifices uh, in this position, even with the knight on c4. Um, but obviously, this is the move you look at, right? Uh, after king f8, you look at to take on take on e5. That's yes, like. like how I see these positions is that like I'm first looking at the most forcing moves like captures and sacrifices and and checks. Uh, so knight takes e5 is the first move I'm looking at. Uh, like I would first look at this move, but then also maybe consider also the move bishop takes a checks as it is a forcing move, yeah, and it destroys the uh, king position of black. So bishop takes a checks looks also very interesting. Bishop takes and then to just go like queen to d2, wanting the queen coming into the attack. Uh, no, this is uh, very dangerous for David. And I mean, still only seven minutes um, for uh, 20 plus moves. So, mm -hmm. uh, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if the players uh, have seen some of these. Uh, yeah. David must have uh, calculated uh, Bishop takes H6. Yes. Well, I'm sure he has missed this this move. Maybe uh, uh, David's uh, idea is that after knight takes e5, maybe he has the stunning resource bishop takes f2 check. Hmm. Wow. And with the point that after king takes f2, queen to c5 check, that hits bo both the queen and the, uh, the king rather and the knight on e5 ready to take. Uh, <laughs> Like, uh, looks very shaky, but maybe it works. And maybe this is a way for, for black to defend this position. If we now go bishop to e3, we have queen takes e5, which seems to hold every, everything together. There is no uh, these covered attacks, yeah? So, and now also the rook on g3 is struggling a bit, and you're threatening knight e4 check. Yeah, uh, yes. Also, so bishop e3, maybe knight e4 is also very strong. Yeah. So... Uh, I guess you have to go king to f1, but after rook takes e, e5, it's uh, still white who has to show the way here, yeah? Yeah. Still That's looks quite dangerous for, for black. Um, well, like, very, very complex uh, position. And uh, yes. I, I'm glad I'm not in David's uh, shoes oh. right now <laughs> with seven minutes on, on the clock. Um, but I mean, yes. he's also, I mean, he's such a great player. and. Um, I think he's he spent his time well now trying to to figure out these different lines and and calculating and I wouldn't be surprised if, if um, after Nils's next move that David will reply uh, quite uh, quickly. Yes, uh, yes even, uh, even, I, even in this type of position. Yes, so I think uh, after Netflix, if I probably uh, David's idea, okay, either he has seen Bishop takes f f two and and he's confident that it works. Or queen to d6 seems like a, a, a maybe more sane option, let's say, eh? like more human and more. Since, yeah. it, like, even if you see that bishop takes f2 most likely works, it's still quite hard to make you do it. Yeah. Since yeah. It, it feels like, since white is so active, that all uh, like tactical things should work out in white's favor as white is more active. But um, so that's maybe why he would hesitate maybe slightly to go bishop takes f2. But Okay, he, he's a really great player, so so he's fully capable of calculating it. But uh, my feeling says that Nils is going to play bishop takes h6 here. It's, it, it feels like a Nils move. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, looking at, the, at uh, the two players and their styles, I think this is a position Nils has uh, been waiting to get in this yes. match. You know? It's maybe more uh, an attacking player, a uh, tactical player. While David is more solid, more positional, 
uh, takes his chances when he gets them. And uh, and therefore, I think Nils will be very happy, at least to, to, to have a position like this. And maybe it's not enough to, to win, but at least he he gets some attacking chances. Uh, yes. And, uh, yeah, very interesting game. For uh, sure, yes. Like, if you're uh, aiming to... To, to play for the mating at attacking play at attacking chess, you really can't ask for a, a more interesting position than this. So it's the board is fully on fire, as as they say. I yeah. think once I uh, saw a game by Nils where he he was playing really uh, strongly on the king side, and like some in, interview asked him, well, why don't you worry that you have sacrificed the pawn and it was not going to to be a mate? Well, yes, but I had like five pieces playing or six, yeah. So yeah. he often just feels that with so many pieces playing, something should work. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess that was something we discussed earlier, that when you have enough pieces in the attack, it should be it should be enough uh, to get yeah, something yes. uh, concretely uh, working. Yeah, no, it's this uh, very famous cast part of game against uh, Karpov, where he's ex- explaining that like he had uh, like six uh, at attackers against like three defenders and like and uh, okay it's fine to to exchange off some defending pieces for a, a attacking piece and these kind of things and uh, so no the pieces here it looks very promising for uh, for white Def- definitely so so you have a feeling that nils now will go for this um, bishop takes uh, h6 option? yes yeah just uh, trying to destroy the the king position even further, uh, saying that your king is is now a here, and after, after takes queen to d2, maybe David could dream ab- about like moving his queen and then escaping with the king to e7. But White is just too active for it to happen. And uh, here, ah, and as I say, uh, this is on the board. Uh, queen to wow. d2. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> Interesting. Very good. Uh, yes. Good call. Wow. So are there other other moves for David uh, in this position? Mm. Uh, yeah. So the first option I would think about was was to go knight to g8 here to defend the 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 h6 pawn here. But it looks very dangerous for sure. Like after knight to g8, um, okay, probably knight takes e e five should be really promising for white as, as well here. Uh, all. All pieces are playing. This really could be a masterpiece game by Nils, like really uh, showing how how to play for dynamics. Yeah. I, and also, I also really in this position, you, you can probably bring the rook to back to f3 just to yes. target f7 again. Uh... Yes, and uh, yeah, all kind of things. Again, this bishop on a2 is like you don't really notice it before it's too late. Yeah, as this, yeah. <laughs> suddenly it's there and it's mate. Um, yeah, now all all kind of threats are in the air. Uh, say if uh, queen to f6, there is rook to f f3, and, and a bishop f5 is quite important. That uh, knight to d7 at, at least wins some material back. Probably also white has several good options here by this point, as uh, all the pieces are playing and black is in a really bad pin. But but I think a a, a position like this, let's say knight to d7 check, bishop takes. Uh, like takes, let's say rook, rook takes, queen takes, and knight takes. Uh, if we only look at material wise, uh, black is not doing so bad here. Like he has a rook and two pieces, but the problem is the coordination of the pieces. Uh, and I think after move like queen to e e five, um, I would really pick white here solely on the ground that the pieces are just so active here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I guess still in some lines you can still. Have some threats for the the black king. But yes, that's a, that's a very good point. That the coordination of the black pieces. Uh, and if white manages to to win one of the minor pieces, then it's probably mm. com- completely over. Um, yes. So, right. but maybe um, I see a different option here for for David. It would really be sp- uh, like really uh, cool if he finds it. It's here to play the move a uh, knight to g4 here. Uh, it is. For sure, not the first move that you think about, but the idea is that you are also defending the the h6 pawn, and after f takes g4, you can play the move queen to g5, which is mm. like sort of defending f6 and also like attacking your queen on d2 in the sense that like if a change of queens, it's of course a good 
trade for Bacchus. Bacchus, the more uh, unsafe king, yeah. So um, that's a very interesting uh, defensive idea, and and, yeah. and that's also the the luxury uh, when you have uh, accepted material, you can always give it back. Yes, yes. When trying to defend a difficult uh, position. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what like has the. To find this move. Sorry. Maybe he has to find this uh, defensive idea. Uh, yes. Uh, so I really think that this is a very critical moment. Uh, if if they will, will be able to here to find knight to g4, h6 g4, and queen to g5, I I actually think David is going to survive this game most most likely. Still, he's very dangerous. He's low on time, and Nils probably will find a way to keep the game going and still being very sharp. Uh, but maybe the worst is over for David. Maybe if he finds yeah. it. If you find that move, yeah, yeah, because it looks like almost any other move uh, is probably just good for Nils, right? Yes, like a, a position of not not to G eight, like if the defense eight six, but like like I've said, like this this feels just too much for for uh, uh, White. White really has uh, deadly attacking possibilities here. Yeah, so. No, it's very in instructive. Yeah, this knight to g4, giving mm -hmm. a away the piece. The hard thing about like ah, but he plays knight to g8. It has been on the board here. Wow. Knight. So he didn't find the resource knight to g or uh, okay. I'm sure he has seen it, but but maybe it was something which he didn't like inside that land, maybe. So oh, I must say I'm a bit surprised he he, uh, he didn't play it because. Yeah, now it just feel like it feels like uh, Nils is winning after yes. after knight takes e5. Yeah, and once again the the same tactic here also fails. Like bishop e6, you can simply just take off this bishop, uh, as far as I can see, yeah. or or maybe yeah, yeah, um, yeah maybe something then... even stronger here, maybe. Um... Even a move like knight to g6 check should be. Really strong taking and then just going rook takes e yeah. e six. It seems like it should be uh, really strong. Uh, there, like it should be several ways here for white to to play. Uh, we are like exchanging off a defending piece, yeah. And um, and, uh, and once again, you see all all of white's pieces are contributing uh, in the attack. Yes. Also in like this position, if we like go back here, uh, every single piece of white is uh, part participating. Like you could maybe say that the bishop on c8 is not developed, but it's very nicely par participating on c1 also, getting ready to sacrifice its itself at uh, any moment. Uh, so yes, Nils has really been following the Morphe principles. He has to bring all the pieces, and yeah, automatic e5, which is on the board, it seems like it's really paying off for Nils. Yeah, here. absolutely. Uh, wow. No, this. Uh... <laughs> You, you you joined the, the game at the right time, uh, so it... <laughs> Yeah, yes. <laughs> Lots sorry, of but... action after you, you joined us. Wow. Yes. And this is, yeah, I mean, this is definitely the most uh, action-packed game, I would say, uh, so far in this in this match. Um, mm. And what a masterpiece by Nils if, if he goes on to win this, uh, win yes. this game. Like, uh, like a modern masterpiece, yes? <laughs> yeah. And now David is down to three minutes. We still have uh, plenty of moves uh, to be played uh, before getting extra time. Yes. And, uh, I mean, I will be surprised if, if he if he manages to to hold on to move forty. Even. Um, yes, my my prediction now is is that this game will will be over before move thirty. That is my prediction. That mm -hmm. It's going to like it just seems to dangerous for David to hold on to this position should be very bad now but, um, but I really like this this kind of positions I'm often, often uh, aiming for something like this in my own games so so you yeah I was about to ask you how how do you uh, describe your uh, playing style as a, as a chess player yeah like I'm Trying to be universal, so to like be able to play most positions, but uh, like uh, deep inside, I'm always an attacking player, and I always like the initiative and to uh, play for the checkmate. So, it, like, it is how I played most of my life, and like it's hard to change this. Yes, 
So yeah, um, yeah. and um, okay, my favorite chess player is probably uh, like Fisher. Yes, like I really like his playing style. Uh, but okay, he is not the most aggressive player uh, in the sense that he was really good at many things. Yeah. So maybe I'm like trying to be in the same way as as him, but at the same time, uh, I like chess. is really what I love the most. So. Yeah, great. And uh, I had a quiz for um, for Mihailo uh, earlier on the mm -hmm. broadcast, and uh, I, I guess you know them that today is uh, Fisher's birthday, right? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's his birthday. He was born in 1943. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, mm. And later this year, it's the 50, 50th anniversary of his famous world championship match on Iceland versus mm. uh, Spassky. Yeah. So this summer, it's, it's yeah, exactly 50 years ago. Yes, and uh, also anniversary of the match against Spassky, the rematch, yes, was also in 1992, in so yeah. 30 years ago. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, at the Sveti Stefan Island. Yeah. Uh, now in, in Montenegro. I actually been there. I think at least I drove uh, on the way to um, from Budva to um, to uh, yeah another city in Montenegro, and mm. it's just a very nice island. Uh, so when you're on the highway, you, you see it uh, out there in in the water, mm. and um, okay. So we have uh, Queen B4. Yes, Queen to B4 is a very good uh, defensive try. Uh, just attacking the queen and saying that okay if you exchange off the queens i'm very happy and if if you move it you always have to watch out for your rook on on e1 uh, yeah. but but it seems there that nils here has a killing move uh, which more or less ends ends the game um, wow. and, and that is the move rook to f3 just ignoring that the queen hangs on d2 but saying that checkmate ends the game yeah yeah so, so queen um, takes d2 rook takes F7, checkmate. Yes. Wow. Checkmate. And that is a really cool checkmate. It's not often you see this. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Wow. So, wow. no, I, I, I think Nils is going to find with Rook F3. He's, um, he sees these things very fast. And also, I mean, that's the luxury of having now 24 minutes on the clock. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I don't want to be uh, critical of of David's uh, uh, how he's spending his time, but at some point you just feel that one day it will come back to haunt him a little bit to constantly yeah, yes. get into time trouble. And uh, I mean, we have to give credit to Nils for for playing a fantastic game. Uh, but maybe with a little mm -hmm. bit more time on the clock, maybe David would have found uh, Knight G4. Yes, which, uh, which uh, saves saves the game probably. Yeah, yes. Like it was also maybe since he was a bit low on time, maybe he doubted himself slightly or may yeah. maybe got a, a bit more tense because of the time pressure factor. And like these kind of things can uh, can affect you into not making the best decision. I think yeah. like uh, getting rid of the time pressure thing, uh, like at some point it, it becomes a habit. Yeah. And it's hard as humans to uh, change our habits. So. Uh, like I'm sure he's aware of it and trying to change it, but it's it's really not not easy. So yeah, absolutely, and I, I think uh, I mean for for most people it's difficult, but especially for chess players because we 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 do we tend to do uh, what seems to be working, you know. So yes, I think a lot of chess players are a bit superstitious. They have their uh, <laughs> bring the, they bring the same pen to the yeah, game, yeah. or they have the same uh, same. Uh, dress or the same t-shirt or whatever uh, yes i'm also guilty of these things so yeah. <laughs> it's really uh, like this. go to the same restaurant uh yeah things like this and uh i think there's this funny story about uh alexei shiro he was playing in a, in a tournament and he won the uh, first game and he went out for dinner afterwards and then uh, he went to a, an italian restaurant mm -hmm. and next day he won again and then he thought, okay, I have to go back to this restaurant. <laughs> and, then, and then he won again. Uh -huh. uh, but at some point, he got tired of the same food, you know, the same restaurant. So after four days of going to the same restaurant and four wins, he was thinking, okay, how do I solve this uh, predicament? Uh, mm -hmm. So the only solution was to take a buy the next day and then change the restaurant. <laughs> so like, not always play the, the same game, man. Into yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, keep the 
chess players are superstitious. Yeah, no, sure. I actually had uh, like not the uh, same story, but maybe somewhat similar. Uh, have you played in Pagunes uh, this tournament in Norway? Yeah, I played one 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 tournament there. Yeah. Yes. So like uh, the first two rounds, like this was back in 2014, so I was quite young, and the first two rounds I actually won. Uh, and I went to this burger shop, like this uh, burger place, and I ate there like before the rounds. But the third round was like a morning round, and I couldn't oh. really eat a burger before this game. <laughs> and uh, I lost this game, and and then I was really desperate, like what to do. I tried to eat the burger for the first round, but it, it just wasn't the same. So, <laughs> and I mean, yeah, I enjoy a good burger, but yeah, to have it for breakfast is a bit. A bit yeah, dumb. no, it's not. <laughs> so yeah. But okay. now, okay, we ha- we do have a move. Uh, let's uh, let's see what's happening. Yes. So I I think what Nils has uh, achieved by playing Rook F3 F5 is that now the king is just even more exposed on on F8, and um, the the king position here is really quite an issue for Nils, uh, for for David rather. Sorry, and um, many many tempting options, but. but at the same time, it's maybe not so easy to see like exactly the killing blow here for Nils. Nils is uh, he he's a piece down, yes. So okay, it's not the worst. I thought maybe he was a rook down or something. So a piece is not so much, uh, no. relatively speaking, yeah. So mm, so let's see. Okay, I I see one quite cool uh, idea here for Nils, and and that is here to go rook to g three. Mm-hmm. Hitting the knight, and the, the point is that in case of queen takes e2, we have knight to d7 check, which is a really cool point. Wow, hitting the king, and, and say after let's say queen takes d7, there's rook to g8 uh, mate. That's a fantastic mate. Wow, yeah, it's <laughs> really rare. I, I've not seen like this kind of things before. It's this really, really cool. is uh, Morphe, Morphe like, yes, uh, the ending to the game. That's for sure. Like, uh, so here, like, it's up a queen and a bishop, but they still mate. Yeah, like I re- remember as a kid, I was so f- fascinated by these things that uh, like you you can be a queen and a, a piece down a rook down, but it's like if it's mate, it ends the game. And so um, really beautiful. And like like Morphe, I mean the famous game uh, One Night at the Opera. Uh, the last move is uh, rook takes d8, and the bishop on d5 is covering yes. uh, the rook, and uh, you just sacrifice your queen. <laughs> and then rook yeah rook d8 uh, checkmate so it's it's at least very similar to, to yeah, that yeah. Um, yes wow these things is uh, like okay there is always this studies yeah like where you have a single knight and you meet your opponent when he has like all the pieces on on the board but again that's maybe a bit too much i i really find this thing beautiful when when they are in, in a practical game mm-hmm. and like uh, like it comes from a real game yes so uh, it's really nice to uh, see them being put in in to work here. So okay, I I think Nils is going to play rook to g g three here most most likely. It's certainly also, also an option to play something like queen to c one, just defending the rook and and saying that the queen is coming to c seven at any moment. Or okay, maybe maybe not now as the rook is hanging, but like it's it's always just very active here on c one also. And you're yeah. saying that yes, I'm a piece down, but your your king safety is so bad that it doesn't matter. I'm going to prevail. Uh, last yeah. but, but okay, I uh, I think Neil series is 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 going to to take a think, maybe five minutes more or something to just to make sure that uh, he calculates everything. And again, what a, what a cool move to play rook g three. Uh, <laughs> like let you, your opponent uh, take your queen uh, once again, and then. Uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, just incredible. Yes, and knight to d7. It's also really cool to like play uh, here after queen to b4 to play rook f3 and then after f5 to then go back to g3. It's really uh, <laughs> yeah, just to provoke f5, yeah. So um, to to open up for the bishop, bishop. Yes. Yeah. So okay, I guess here that after uh, rook to g3, bishop to e6 is probably what. Uh, um, David here should should play. Okay, if uh, if if variant for here that queen takes e1 was an option, maybe queen to d7 would be really beautiful. 
if it weren't for so like yeah. uh, something like this i again but okay it it, it fails to do the quintex e1 so yeah that's, uh, that's they find uh, something else um <laughs> Maybe not like to find something. Okay, but I I think also after bishop to e6, it, it seems very very strong to just go queen to e2, and in case of bishop takes a a2, uh, knight to to d7 check, king f7, and queen h5 is a checkmate. Also, yeah. wow. <laughs> also quite a remarkable construct. All, all these yeah. different uh, lines, which uh, leads to to checkmate, and, no, it's and, really and white, white's rooks are so well placed, uh, cutting off the king and. Uh, and the knight as well. Wow. Yes. So many so, resources yeah. in this um, position. Um, yeah, yes. No, it really just shows like if you put all of your pieces in, in into the game, like what kind of resources they can uh, produce for you and yeah? like all, all kind of possibilities that's certainly at your disposal. It's yeah. really beautiful. And I mean, I often get the question, you know, from friends or beginners in chess, um, it's so difficult to play the end, uh, middle game mm. because they have maybe already learned the general concepts of the opening, you know, uh, taking control in center, develop pieces, get mm. your king into safety. But then they're struggling, you know. And my my general advice is to to try and, and look for um, a common uh, goal in the position. It can be attacking a weak pawn. It can be. Mm. Uh, trying to make some attacking uh, threats, and then, but anyways, the 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 main point is to to uh, to to make your pieces uh, coordinated and yes. work together. Uh, so that is generally what the middle game is all about: that you yeah. coordinate your pieces and and make them work together. Yes, like kind of maybe like how I uh, approach a, a middle game position would be something like. Like I know the opening theory from the starting position, uh, and then I I have maybe seen some model games, so I know how to ar arrange my pieces. I have an idea. Okay, I'm going to put my pieces like this. So that's my I idea, and then I like see accordingly to how my opponent puts his pieces. Also, since you can't like only look at yourself, eh? you also have to look at your opponent. Uh, but uh, I like, think it's very good to. To, to know the opening, but, but also know the middle game plans uh, resulting from the op openings that you have an I idea. But this, of course, takes time and it's not an easy thing to, to do. But I, I think to some extent, like chess is like pattern recognition. So you just have to, have to see many games, play many games, and uh, eventually you will get a good idea uh, as to how to put your pieces and so on. And, so, and, and that's a great advice because once you find the the openings you like to play then uh, analyze uh, games played in that opening by strong players and then you get some some ideas how to approach the middle game and yes. and, and different plans uh, to look for in so, uh, in those uh, openings yeah so i think also a good thing uh, i'm not sure if it's so smart but at least i like to do it like you pick your favorite player for me it was fisher and then you try to base your open openings like what he also played so mm -hmm. you kind of have the model games which are seen from this and then you also try to play it and okay you can also switch it up to like with some other players also but i find this very fun and also yeah. very in inspiring also so so, that's so, so when you're doing let's say preparations you you mostly look at uh, fisher games or well okay it was a period in my chess learning let's say that i was mainly just looking at these games just mm -hmm. Learning, uh, I know almost every game of him by heart. So, but uh, oh, that's, that's uh, impressive. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, okay. Nowadays it's a bit mixed there, yeah? so I try to do both tactics and strategic. Uh, of, of of course, there's a lot of great players, all the world champions are great players, and they were often good at different things. So, like if you want to learn di dynamics, Kaspar is the man you you should go to. If you want to learn strat strategic and slow po positional play you can look at uh, Karpo or maybe Fisher also uh, and nowadays Magnus like is uh, really good maybe a combination of both Karpo and Fisher maybe and also Kasparov he also can mate mm -hmm. clearly uh, but I think it's good to like mix and look at the old champions to learn from them and I really think we, you can learn a lot by, by looking at these games yeah absolutely um, um, okay
okay. Nils is still thinking. Um, yeah. I guess that's that's uh, that's quite smart. Just yeah. to double check different lines. You still have time on the clock. Uh, David is down to 44 seconds. Um, yeah. So. Do you think if, if Nils plays Rook G3, um, we might see a resignation soon from David? Um, or yes. Like... Fight, or will he fight on? So I... I think after Rook to G, okay, probably by this point, David has realized that his position is is lost, and probably he has seen Rook to G G three, and he has maybe pre prepared to play Bishop to E six very fast. But after Bishop to E six, if then Nils splits out Queen to E two, probably he is going to to go down to like two seconds left, and then if he finds something, he is going to play it, and if not, maybe he's he is going to re resign. That is what I think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, but but it's really smart by Nils to use his time. Really, I I don't think there is anything more frustrating than not winning a one chess game, uh, especially due to reasons like playing too fast or getting too excited. And these things is really one of the most painful things you can experience. So it yep. makes sense to guard yourself from this and to use your time. So yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm just catching up uh, with the, the chat and. Mm. Uh, Coconut Kane saying great comeback by Nils. Yeah, it will definitely be a great comeback. And uh, if he ends up winning this game, uh, they will be tied at the three and a half, three and a half. And uh, Roger asking which move are they on? They're on 24th move now, I believe. Move, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, severe time trouble for David. Uh, yes. He has uh, like. Uh, 44 seconds. Okay, he gets 30 seconds on every move, but for 16 moves, yeah, to uh, yeah. to play in less than 30 seconds on every move is quite a task. But I I think uh, David's main task here should be to okay, if he gets to move 40, that's all already an a, a achievement, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, it was interesting because we had uh, Mihailo on the on the broadcast before you joined, mm. and he. He's also a mathematician, and he told me that he has a mathematical approach to time travel. So mm. um, when David had about 14 minutes left for, I think it was uh, 23 moves or something, um, then he's, he calculated, you know, the amount of time left on the clock and also the 30 seconds extra. So he said David should play. Uh, he should not spend more than one minute per move. Because mm. in total, he had one minute and 10 seconds or something mm. on average per move. And then <laughs> afterwards, David spent six minutes on one move. And then he kind of said, OK, I, I don't really approve of this because even though the move David played was a good move, he also had other moves in the position, which, uh, which were good options uh, mm -hmm. for the one he played. And then later on, as we can see now in the game, he, he is really down to, you know, only seconds, uh, which uh, which might, you know, it's difficult to say, but it's um, which might have contributed to him not finding. Uh, yes. Before, um, yeah, no, it's very in yeah. no, interesting on. what what me Carlos said. Um, what I usually think about, like uh, when, when it comes to time and in chess is that my my general rule is to not think more than 15 minutes on 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 one move 15 to 20 minutes uh, yeah. i i i think i also heard this rule by, by magnus once i i think he said it like if you think for more than 15 to 20 minutes at, at some point your head just gets really tired yeah. and you're not really uh, like doing any quality thoughts yeah um and and i think also rishi like at uh, like Quite recently, actually, I tweeted that the, the main mistakes that he did was from either playing too fast or for thinking too long, which is quite a thing. But I see on now that Nils took on B4. Wow. Okay. 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 So at least it, it will not be a uh, mate now, yeah? But okay, he will be material up, it seems. Which is also yeah. a safe way to, to, to do it, but it's not a mate. <laughs> okay. Check. So king to g7 is, is forced. Uh, he then wants to take on e8. And okay, for now he is an exchange up, it seems. Um, if the knight falls, th then the knight on g8 falls. So, so he will still be an exchange up with a mating attack. 
So that the move which David probably should, should have played is knight to f6, hitting the rook and uh, then wanting to take off the knight. Um, but it seems to me here that Nils probably have, have then calculated to go rook to e7 check, king takes g6, and then to play rook to g3 check. Yeah. When after your king h5, there is bishop f, or what's the best way to, to, to do it? Okay, there should be several ways to, to do it. Maybe this is like bishop to f7 check, king h4, and say rook to g6, maybe hitting the knight and taking here. Uh, the black pieces are just too far away from, from the action. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's see. Okay, I, 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 the way Nils here played also makes sense. So, I mean, if it wins, then it just wins. Yeah. So. A bit more safe approach, maybe, but uh, not as flashy as Rook D3, but still, yes. yeah. Like, it is, um, I, I think also Fisher talked about this on some TV show that, like, uh, he, he sees the same combinations at, as as Morphe, let's say, but like his all, all, all opponents does not allow it. And also in modern chess, uh, like if they have a way to just reach a winning end, end game, they're also just just going to do it. While well, Morphe played for for the mate, uh, so that's just a professional way, let's say, yeah, just making sure to win the game. That's that's what matters. Yeah. And um, so I I approve the, the main objective, I guess, and. Um, and if you have found a variation that you know works, then yeah, there's no need to to do it uh, any yes. differently, I guess. Um, I mean, you're not gaining more points by, uh, let's say, style points. Yeah, it's only yeah. okay. Uh, like it's uh, very nice to win in this matter, but it only gives you one point. So better yeah. to make sure to win it. Absolutely. So is the uh, like live a, a bit frozen, or it seems like David only has one move here after knight to g g6. Uh, he he is certainly not thinking for 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 so long. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a one move situation, so uh, might be some delay on the transmission. Mm -hmm. but, um, it could also be that he's um, he's thinking of resigning. Even yeah, um, could also be an option. Uh, looks. Yeah, just looks in extremely tough to 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 even try and get some some type of counterplay. And as yeah. you said, all, all the pieces uh, for David on the queen side is really not participating in the game at all. Uh, yes, like this uh, bishop pair on c8, the rook on a8, and uh, it's often like when the bishop on on c8 is not playing, it also means that the rook on a8 is also bad. Um, this is something I, I talk a lot about in my course also, like that, that uh, like two pieces are, are, are out of the game. And um, yep. so, so. And uh, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about your, your uh, chessable course. Um, let's just see if, uh, if um, David has played a move or, or not. Mm -hmm. um, Ah, oh, oh, okay, now the moves uh, came in. So now, yeah, we are following the lines we were discussing. So king to g6, uh, rook to g3 check. Yeah, it's on the board now. And, um, so oh, yeah. even if the um, queens are off, off the board, uh, the white initiative still still continues. And it is like what Kaspar was talking about that, like you have lost some attacking pieces, sure, but also the defending pieces have, have gone. So the attack is really quite dangerous still. And yeah, here Nils have several ways of playing. The coordination is simply just too bad for, for Black King. Yeah, and I guess the only thing, you know, uh, Black is hoping for is to, to have time to play, I don't know, Knight, E4 to get yes. some threats, but it's it's too little too late and you don't even have time to to yeah it's wide yeah. to move in this position so it's yeah it's gonna be tough yeah knight e4 maybe some desperate try could also be to go like bishop takes f2 and knight to e4 if it was black to move uh, yeah. but but of course Nils is not going to to just wait around here he's uh I'm quite sure that uh 
he has seen this position from his head after he played Quintex before, and yeah. uh, he he's now going to play something he's sure just wins. So. But also, yeah, I like this idea to to not necessarily go to f8 with the bishop directly, but to to reroute it to go back to e2. Mm -hmm. uh, so like to to go bishop c4 here, yes. Yeah, for example. Mm -hmm. Bishop c4. So, okay, let's see. So okay, I bishop takes f2 should not really be an option here. Also, yeah, like you should just be be b2. Passive on the eighth rank of the rook to g8. Uh, this yeah. should be quite deadly. Uh, exactly. Also, may, may, maybe some mating pattern could also be a big issue here for, let's say, uh, like um, here, you are just making a random move. Let's say, like b, b, b6. Okay, I'm sure there are several ways, but also possible to go like bishop f7 and like, okay, even something like this, yeah, should win, and then bishop yeah. to e6. But okay, uh, also king to g3 should just be a mate soon. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, bishop c4, I like this idea also. Um, I, I think by this point, there are several ways to play it. Okay, yeah, he, he chose your move with bishop to c4. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But I must say that you have been guessing quite nicely yeah, the, the moves that were going to come. <laughs> yeah, it helps to, to get some uh, computer assistant, uh, <laughs> assistance. But uh, earlier in the match, we didn't have a computer. So, um, yeah. Mm. It's, it's, uh, both is nice, but uh, yeah, also it's good to, to look at the games without computers to, yeah. to try and guess, guess the, the plants and so on. Yes. But yeah, this just looks uh, quite hopeless for, for David, I would say. Um, yes, so, so now I think David is most most likely here going to go knight to e4, uh, just like the uh, final try, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I'm quite like, it's lost by force for sure, but like at least you go down s swinging as, uh, as they say, like. Uh, but okay, I, I think quite, it should be like bishop to e e2 check, King h4 and let's say rook takes e4 here seems quite strong and like rook to g g6 and g3 and uh, bishop f1 should be on on top of mate. That's a nice uh, mate. Yes, and it's the same pattern that the bishop the pieces are simply just not playing. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm quite sure that Nils has this planned out. This bishop e2 and rook to g6. Okay, uh, I was saying that he was not going to be a mate, but <laughs> Probably it's going to be a mate here also, just with yeah. a bit less pieces. <laughs> so. Yeah, David is down to 40 seconds again. Um, not easy at all. And, uh, no, not easy. Like, the only good piece that uh, David really has is the bishop on a7. It's kind of like the same bishop. Uh, like on a a2 they have the same function they are just like much behind but they are really strong but um, unfortunately it doesn't help to only have one one good piece uh, you need to have several and also if you go the special decks f2 you're also exchanging off your only good piece and you're left with the bad pieces so the bishop on c8 and rook on a8 and um, I just have to mention that uh, in this famous game by Morphy, his opponent also never got the, the rook on the king side into the game because of this very bad bishop uh, uh, as well. So I think the, the rook was on h8 the whole game mm -hmm. and, and possibly also the, the bishop on f8. So, yes, yes. So it just goes to show that, um, yeah, you have to develop your pieces uh, in the Definitely. opening. Um, and also in terms of the bishop, yeah, if you don't get the bishop in the game, uh, your rook will most likely also be in the corner. And that's, yeah, but that's that's, that's very true. Yeah, it's a huge, and it's like uh, it's eight pieces. Like it's a uh, bishop is worth three and a rook is worth five, so it's like uh, essentially eight points not not playing. Yep. And like uh, you have not lost those pieces, but if if they, they don't have a function, you're you're at a heavy this. Advantage. So yes, the, the developing pieces is 
good for a reason and you should really do it so i guess now after bishop to e2 check king h4 and say rook to g6 uh the the same theme uh, like with g2 and bishop f1 is very yeah. hard to do. stop here so i mean yeah that's a fantastic uh mate mating idea um no, I'm, I really like this game, Panils. It's a very nice game. So. so this is the position now. Bishop e2, king h4. Yeah. And now we expect rook g6. Do you think David will allow the mate or will he resign? <laughs> okay, I, I think most chess players does not uh, allow the checkmate. Like if, if they see it, like they resign be, before it happens on, on the board but maybe since this game was so nice maybe david will be gentleman like and uh allow the mate yes to show I mean, yeah i think i mean it's very understandable i mean everybody hates losing yes um, but once in a while when your opponent just plays a really fantastic game i think uh chess players in general should allow your opponent to to mate in those uh, cases because uh as you said uh and chess is a gentleman sport. I mean, uh, once in a while, I think you should just allow uh, your opponent to make sure. a mate yes. and, uh, and applaud him like uh, Spassky did yeah. 50 years ago, you know, after a masterpiece. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's nice. And uh, Yes, and it's also nice for the, like for the viewers to see why you resigned. Yeah? To see the mate on, on the board is also a pleasant thing. So Yeah, um, absolutely. Definitely think it's a good, good sport to let the mate happen. Yeah. And after rook g6, uh, yeah. Are there any? Okay. Maybe, maybe you can try f4 just to prevent. Yeah, maybe f4 is is the best defense to not uh, allow this mate. As if you then take, uh, then then it's like a pin here, yeah, and suddenly the game will turn. So. Yeah. But. Um, now I think rook here is is quite strong, wanting to go rook h6 uh, with a mate, and if h5, well, uh, okay, very strong here is rook takes f6, yeah. Ah, oh, nice, very nice. But okay, at some point it gets too much and mate finally. And they have the same. Wow. Yeah. 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 Rook g6 on board. Okay, it doesn't help for David that that he has almost no time left. But I think it's okay. So. I, I, uh, my prediction now is that after rook e g7, David is going to resign. That is my pre prediction, but I hope he will play it out. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's <laughs> find out. We, we will see. But, but okay, David has been fighting, so I mean, he has not like gone down right away, like he has, like, yeah, he's yeah, still asking yeah, some yeah. questions. We have uh, we have reached uh, thirty moves, and uh, so so you you uh, you uh, your prediction of uh, Nils winning before move thirty did not happen, but uh, yeah. but now we will see if he will uh, be mated, David, or if he or if he chooses. Yeah. To yes. Win. No. Okay. It's a huge uh, achievement by David if he can last till <laughs> move forty, but uh, I doubt it. Yeah. It's uh, but. Um, okay, maybe if Nils would have kept the queens, maybe my prediction would have proved right. But it's fully understandable what what Nils chose to do, and it's like, like very good judgment of, of him to understand that this position is also just completely winning. Uh, yeah, like it, just yeah. in practical practical terms, it's a very reasonable decision from from Nils. Yeah. Okay, so rook to g g seven is now played. Rook e g seven. So let's see if I <laughs> no, but it's a really nice po position. Also, this so and will there be mates? That's the big question now. Nils is definitely winning, but uh... no, but it's really so nice. Like and um, now white is threatening root takes h6 with just a checkmate, so h5 makes sense, and like this is really, really beautiful. Yeah. It's really nice, and then to just go G3. And to, uh, this is quite a 
remarkable mate also. Only with a rook and piece, but it's mate. Yep. Um, I hope we see this ending. Uh, yeah, I hope so too. I hope so. Uh, so too. Fingers crossed. Yeah, and David is just down to seconds on the clock. Uh, come on, David. Let him play, play H5. <laughs> yeah, play H5. Um, oh, yes. Good. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I was wrong. I was wrong. Good. Let's see. And now Rook takes F6. Yeah. Let's go. It's like a fitting end to a masterpiece. So Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, maybe, maybe David now uh, agrees with us that, uh, okay, Nils has played a brilliant game. I will, I will allow this perfect ending uh, to yes, the game. Yes, yes. Um, and I'm sure Nils has seen this idea with, with Rook takes F6. And, uh, yeah. I'm quite sure that, that he has seen it, like many moves. I had like, yeah. Uh, so, but also, yeah, other moves are sufficient as well. Um, Probably, yes. Okay, yeah. and this one. There we have it. Okay. But, wow, what nice. a game! What a game by Nils. Yes. Hats off to him. Yeah. No. Okay. It uh, also show like the Italian is uh, really quite a dangerous weapon nowadays. Also, since if if you play the Spanish like. It is so heavily analyzed. Also, the Berlin defense, it's so hard to break it. Yeah. So, so I, I think the opening choice by, by Nils was really smart just to get some playable position and to see what what happens. Ah, so they played bishop to g4 here, which seems like a good defense also. But I, I think um, several ways to win. Maybe the Simplest one is just to go rook takes g g4 check h takes and then rook takes f4 and to then go rook takes g4 and rook to g8 like after the king is forced to h5. Yeah. So that seems like the cleanest way, let's say. So okay, I'm sure there are several ways, but this seems like the most sane way. <laughs> um. But there's also. Uh... According to the computer, there's also a very nice idea, king h2, mm -hmm. threatening g3. But, but after then, bishop takes f, f2, how is the mate? Yeah, that's the problem. You won't get mate, probably, but then I guess you just take on, on g4. Um, okay, but, that, but I think Nils is going to, to a rook takes g4, like just to get yeah. things by, by, by force. It seems very clean. Uh, also, uh, like... I after agree with you. Yeah. yeah, like like takes if rook to e8, you have the very nice rook takes g4 check, king h5, and then rook to e4 check. It blocks the thing, and then you take the rook. So yeah, absolutely. Um, as far as I can see. So okay, I'm among other ways of winning. So okay, a, a bit of a pity that we didn't see the mate, but uh, yeah, I was I hoping <laughs> to to see. Yeah, okay, any place uh, rook g4, yeah. like you predicted, and now. It should be over. Um... Well, okay, now I I think David is going to resign after Rook takes F4. As it's no mate, it's, we might as well reassign them if it's not yeah. going to be so nice mate. <laughs> so yeah, very nice game. Absolutely, and and I liked what you said about uh, the opening choice because. Obviously, the the many uh, different uh, lines in in the Spanish opening is uh, is still very popular. But as you said, also been analyzed, you know, uh, for for so long. And uh, yes. I like the idea of bringing it somehow back to basic, you know, with the Italian opening and and uh, and that's often the opening you you learn when you start playing chess. Yes, right. And it's nice. To see, it's nice to see the top players in the world, you know, also playing. Uh, the same opening and yes like uh, i like i think like six seven years years ago they were saying that ah, the e e talent you are just playing like this and then you just play the middle game like there there is no theory well yeah. nowadays it has the middle game has also been an analyzed but 
it is impossible to look at everything. And uh, that's like, I, I still think we are many years ahead before the Italian is going to be too much. And unless there is simply just too many ideas. And yeah, like, like what Nils here played with, with A4 and Rook A3, Rook to, to, D, to D3 just shows. So um, yeah, not the Italian. I, I, I also played my, myself quite much. So I really like it. Also, also, um, yeah, we can catch up with uh, the position, but um... he played king g5 and king f6 and rook takes a4. Okay. Okay, I guess since since they are playing a match, probably it makes sense to like not resign and to like not make it easy for all opponent. They try to be as unpleasant as possible in a yeah. sense. So maybe that's that's why he's playing on, but. Yeah, uh, Nils is a piece up and shouldn't have any problems converting this this position. No, looks um, looks completely winning for mm. for White. Yes, uh, and I mean even without uh, he maybe even without the pawn on B B two, White should have. Yeah. Yes. I mean, okay. If the pawn was not a bit too, I can understand uh, David playing on like. But then the pawn, pawns are rolling. But yeah, uh, this uh, pawn has a very good function of being a defensive piece. Yeah. Also, so. And b3 makes a lot of sense. Um, you take away the black rook from defending, and yeah, okay. Now we we have a result. Yeah. Res uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, very nice game by. Uh, yeah, I mean, hats off for him. A fantastic game. Uh, and a great result for him. Uh, he's been uh, trailing in the match. And, uh, now he's back to, to three and a half, uh, three and a half. Yeah. Uh, so. Very exciting. Only three, three games to go. And um, two wins uh, each. And uh, yeah, anything can happen now before yes. the, the last few games. And obviously, David will have the white pieces tomorrow. Um, so um, I'm sure he will uh, be very eager to to get another win. And um, you probably know, but I mean, it's so interesting because all the games in this match, White has been better. I mean, uh -huh. from from slightly better to like having a big big advantage. Uh, and I mean, if you look at the statistics, I mean, White uh, wins more games than Black at this level, but. It's not often you, you see that white is better seven games straight. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, even at this level. So, so yeah, I'm 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 a bit surprised, and and that also might give David some hope for tomorrow that he can yeah that he can put some pressure on yeah he can put some pressure and uh, and um, and go for another win. And uh, yeah, the players will join us uh, shortly mm -hmm. um, to give us their insights into this very interesting uh, game and uh, we have some uh, time to kill so I will just uh, mention the, the, um, the charity fundraiser uh, we're doing a uh, joint effort between Chess24 and uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council as you can see on the broadcast we do have a QR code uh, so if you just uh, put your uh, phone uh, put the camera on your phone up to the screen it should be quite easy to, to donate uh, through that. And uh, the goal is to reach $20,000. We're halfway there uh, at the moment. So any contribution at all is, uh, is very helpful uh, in reaching uh, that goal. And um, yeah, and Tor Fredrik, yeah, you recently uh, published uh, a chess course on the... Yes. What's the name of the course? Yeah, it is called New Neutralize the Catalan. All is right. Good. Yes. So, so tell us a bit more about the course and, and uh, why should people uh, have a look at it? Yeah, so uh, it it is a course, a, a, a reporter for the black side against the Catalan. So um, like the Catalan is very fashionable nowadays. Uh, we, we saw in the Tata Steel that Magnus was, was playing it game after game. Uh, like... It is when white fianchettos is bishop to g2, and this op opening is very hard to play with, with black, with often just putting pool 
positional pressure. Uh, so I, I de decided to make a course for the black side to deal with this pressure to try to find a solution and to also uh, like get the position that is also playable uh, for a win and to get fighting chances. Uh, so so in, inside the course, I'm looking much at the arising middle game po positions, telling you like how to play the middle game, when to uh, take, take the pawn on, on C4 that White is offering, uh, and how to play the resulting positions. Uh, also a reoccurring theme in the Catalan is that the bishop on C8 is a passive piece. So we are always trying to avoid this. And I'm giving in the course like how to play these positions and um, there's often the theme also that white sacrifices a, a pawn uh, and the downside of sacrificing a, a pawn is that at some point you have to win it back and then the task of the one that is a pawn up is to know what to do in, in the meantime uh, while, while being a pawn up. So often we are getting good de development and then we, we can get this sort of uh, like white has the bishop pair but uh, we have some more time, and this kind of di dynamical questions is really in interesting. And because of this, the, the positions are very sharp. So, uh, yes. So, if if you're having some troubles with the uh, Catalan, like you get passive or bad positions, um, please ch check out the course. Um, so, yes. Yeah, sounds sounds great. And um, I mean, I guess it helps uh, for your advertisement that uh, I mean, the world champion uh, plays it. And it's not easy to break down the, the world champion, so you need some secret uh, weapons, uh, <laughs> I guess. Yes, and, okay, uh, I can guarantee you, if you follow my course and you play Magnus in the classical game, yeah. at least like you will be uh, good, like the first 10 to 15 moves. Yeah, so, that's great. After that, <laughs> so yeah. And um, while we're waiting on the players, they should be at any moment. Um, I have to congratulate you because uh, this uh, weekend you became... Uh, you won the Norwegian league with your team, uh, Wolleringa, and you did really well. You scored five and a half out of six. Yes, I did. Yeah, that's a great achievement. And and actually, both Nils and David is uh, members of, of your team. They uh, are. But they were okay. obviously playing this match in London. And yeah, just tell us a little bit about the, the last uh, few rounds of the league and, and how was it to, to win? Yes. So uh, going into the last weekend, we were... On the same points as Magnus uh, club Offerspiel, um, and we and we were playing against Offerspiel on Friday, uh, so of course this final match was uh, really uh, like uh, Im important. So like we had a team dinner on Thursday, and like it was really good spirits. Everyone was ready to fight. Uh, we ended up winning this match five one, uh, wow. so it was a huge success. And uh, yes, everyone was just very happy and played their best chess. And we also won the, the round on Saturday and Sunday. So it was just a very good team effort. And we finally won the league. So just a great ex experience. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, you had some good uh, results, I would say, you know, in the last uh, year or so. And, and gradually becoming a better player, gaining some rating points. How, how do you see uh, your, your chess future uh what's your plans what's your goals yes yeah, so uh, currently i'm taking a gap year so i'm i'm not studying i'm mainly just just playing chess uh, so my short-term goal is to become a grandmaster uh, i hope to achieve this within a year and then i i will see i uh, i try to not think too far ahead uh but be, becoming a grandmaster and yeah just Keep on en enjoying playing chess. That is my goal. So yeah, that sounds good. And and I mean, many people and and strong chess players say that uh, you shouldn't be too um, fixated about you know the rating or the titles. Uh, it's more about the process and becoming a better player. So so how do you work on chess uh, in your everyday life, and how do you kind of uh, study uh, to become a better player? Yeah. So. Um... It is kind of like you you do some work that you always have to do, like you like update yourself on the current state of theory. And you do the tactical exercises, uh, and and you try to follow the live games, like what is being played now nowadays, and try to understand what is going on, uh, how 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 uh, like 
why they are making the moves that they're making the, the best players in the world. And so it's like a combination of this and working with books. Uh, bas basically, like playing and trying to, to understand what you need to improve on and then to just do the measures that's needed and ho hopefully Im improve as a re result of this. And also, like the most things that, that I'm doing, it is like I, I want to do it myself. Like it comes from in inside. I really enjoy just working on chess. So, I mean, when it's fun, it's a lot more easy. Yeah, so, yeah, of course. And uh, and Roger in the chat saying good luck to it, however it goes. And uh, yeah, it must be exciting for you to have yeah. a gap year to kind of uh, focus on chess, not having to think about work or school or um, gives you a bit more freedom, I guess, to kind yes. of, uh, um, yeah, to see how it goes. And and um, any tournament plans coming up? Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm actually playing the European championship uh, at the end of this month in Slovenia and mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to play there so it's going to be a huge tournament for me uh, a good op opportunity uh, and after the European I'm going to play Fagernes as I mentioned yeah, oh, yeah. this burger story <laughs> so <laughs> yeah is so that is my there? sorry is the burger place still there in yeah Fagernes? yeah no no it's really close it, it is like to the hotel but like right there uh, <laughs> so I might eat there also <laughs> yeah okay that would be interesting yes. and uh, i think uh, i mean nils will also play in the european championship uh, obviously yes. many many strong players so uh, hopefully you will have a good experience there and and uh, yeah. i guess that's the best way to improve to play stronger players than yes yes and, Since and it's like... learn, learn from those games yeah yes exactly like uh, when you're playing those really strong grandmasters they are really going to test you and to try to beat you in every way and then you can also learn your weaknesses and uh, like what what you should work on so it's like uh, like in invaluable practice let's say yeah so. absolutely and um we have a question from uh, jay scott which books do you use to study uh boretsky uh or good mm. probably um, referring to the end game studies right yeah to to the end games so, um, okay, I would maybe take like three books, which I really like. Uh, so, of, of course, there, there is the Turetsky uh, Endgame Manual. So I'm looking at it from time to time, though it's very like complicated and there is like so, so many lines to look at. So at some point, like my head hurts from <laughs> looking at this book. So uh, the book maybe which I've looked at the most is the uh, Endgame Strategy Book. I think it's written by Serge. Uh, and also a book which I think is really good is written by uh, Panchenko, a, Rush, a Soviet grandmaster. He's written two volume books on the end game, which I think is really good. Um, so this will be the main books for the end game uh, uh, for me. So very good. And uh, I mean, we have a lot of uh, viewers um, that are, I would say, maybe beginners or intermediate players. Mm. Uh, what are what, what's your best advice? Uh, on, on improving for, for them mm. in general. Yeah, so uh, my, like, how I did it was mainly just playing really much. I, I just played and played. Uh, but I, I think if you like and play much, but also analyze your game uh, that you're playing so that you try to learn from the mistakes that you're doing, that you're not doing the same mistakes over and over again, uh, that this can um, like help, help you. And also like to work hard so that you see re re results at least for me uh, it i get much more motivated when i see results and it's a lot more fun so kind of just like as i say work hard play hard yes just uh, <laughs> that's that's how it worked for me so yeah it's, um, and, and, and that's interesting because i guess it's quite uh, individual what's the best approach and but i find also just to play a lot of chess um, yes but i guess you also have to be a bit disciplined and try yeah. and, and analyze your own games uh, it's tempting to just play and play and play and, and, yes. and, and forget to kind of analyze. And, uh... Yeah, so maybe what, what I mean by play and play and play is maybe to play some classical games also, like maybe not only Blitz, since Blitz at, at some point maybe be, becomes like a, let's say, video game or like it, it's very uh, addicting, but at some point maybe not so useful. So classical chess, I would really uh, highlight and it's of course very important to play it. Yeah, so, absolutely. So. Um, 
just checking if we have the players. Uh, not yet. It will be interesting to see if we get both of them or we might only get Nils. Uh, that's understandable, but then we can then you can um, praise his wonderful uh, attacking game. Yeah, no, this uh, game which Nils had here, like, it is like you can have, let's say, 10 like sad games, but if you have this one game, you get really happy. And, and uh, Tor, I just have to uh, interrupt because we are now joined by the players, so um, they will have a seat and you can... Sure. Uh, have a quick run through with them. Yeah. Hey, how are you doing? Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. Congrats on a very good game, Nils. Thank you. <laughs> I see the engine running, so. <laughs> yeah. Should we go yeah. through it or? Yeah, we, we can go quickly. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, so let's go, go through here. So it, it was a Italian. I, Italian yeah. So here, we, I mean, we can either spend uh, 20 seconds or talk for a few hours about the various movies. <laughs> yeah. I think we can skip it, yeah. Okay, so, so okay, maybe is, we... Yeah, I mean, the, it's the interesting thing start up for D4, Knights, as you see, back, and then A4. Yeah. Was yeah. this preparation or, or you... Yeah, it was preparation. I mean, in, in right and say there was this game, uh, Bidit, against Mamediaro, uh, with... Uh, uh, we, we did uh, lost in the end with white, but he had a very nice position. So mm -hmm. uh, I think the Mamadjar did not play a5, but a5 is the is the computer recommendation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, this rook a3 is very interesting. Uh, I mean, the idea is, is simple. Yeah, rook should go to g3 later on, and uh, mm -hmm. I mean, after I give the pawn, and here black can take on d4 immediately or or delay, like in the game. It's all very very complicated stuff. Yeah. So uh, I. Guess here that the point is that yeah your rook yeah comes. exactly this is probably just yes, the better version because rook eight is very useful so mm -hmm. so the rook eight bishop a two and black can still wait and delay if he if he wants to like bishop a seven yeah right? I wasn't sure whether to try bishop a seven or not yeah bishop b one and bishop b one I would probably really play have to take on mm -hmm. yeah because now I'm threatening to move the knight to d two so so take and. I mean, yeah. take with knight, maybe even with bishop, maybe. Okay, I guess knight is most natural. Hard, yeah, yeah, hard to say. And then, yeah, I was just worried about you kind of playing slowly. Exactly, like take, take. I don't know about rook three first, maybe before rook d three. Yeah, rook d three was my intention because I need to uh, kick, bishop. kick the bishop. Let's say it goes back to a seven. Uh, now I can go rook g three, and there is no bishop e five. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit strange, basically, because I'm I'm a pawn down and I don't have any direct threats. But slowly, it's very dangerous. Like B3, yeah. Bishop B2, I would push F4. So, yeah, I basically spent ages looking at a position. I, I couldn't see it uh, exactly. Yeah. Wow. But, okay, it's a really cool po position, yeah? Like, uh, really new and fresh. So It's, it's very interesting. I mean, the IDs uh, are known, but uh, I don't know if this specific version has been played. Uh, okay. So let's see. So David yeah, took and took immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he took care yeah. of the four. Sorry? Yes, yes. So this was the game, yes? So yeah, this is the game. So take, take. This is all uh, quite normal. Rook d3, yeah. bishop c5. I went back, yeah. Oh, you went, oh, you went to, yeah, yeah. To, uh, I couldn't figure out which was best. Yes. Maybe bishop c5. Bishop c5 was also an option, yeah. I was worried about with the e5 here. Um, yeah, queen, knight f3. Mm -hmm. D, knight e5. Yes, knight g6. Exactly, and here in the, in the game you would have. Uh, Whoops. I also missed bishop f2. Actually, we both missed because in the ah, game bishop. with the bishop on a7 you would have queen b queen c5 or something. Yeah, yeah. You're fine. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the but bishop here I also yeah, I missed the same thing. <laughs> it's not easy to see from afar. Yeah, it's very hard. To yeah, see. but it's also not three, three, queen, <laughs> should be possible to see. I don't know. Yes, yeah, so, I mean bishop c5, but it's so hard to. To say which one is more accurate, but uh, yeah, okay, also this not exactly for the queen. Yeah. Okay, now wow. it's everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, it's better. Yeah, I mean maybe bishop c five is is better. It's hard to say, but bishop yes. a seven. Yeah, e five, queen e seven. Well, and, I mean, I guess knight h seven is technically possible, but yeah. uh, I was originally planning to play bishop c five and then knight h seven. Again, I mean it's so so, so hard to say. Yeah. Uh, the queen a7 is like the like the most logical move. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
and now okay. yeah we are we, i don't know how, if we should have this engineer i don't, yeah, I don't know how yeah, to, maybe you know how mm -hmm. are there yeah. are there yeah 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 Oops. i'm not engine was saying rook f3 uh, yeah but okay rook f3 is really deep yeah it's very hard maybe the point is like if you take yeah. maybe 94 or something a d94 actually yeah. uh, that actually, it looks strong when you see it but it's yeah. Very hard to understand. Yes. You, you, no, not I mean, yeah. I just look at Rook F3 in some positions. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I don't uh, think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe. No. I mean, I thought what I did was very, lo very logical. Like Rook okay. B. Yeah. Uh, also, I'm going sort of all in now. Yeah. So take. Yeah, so take. Uh, not to C4. And here. Uh, sorry. Uh, it seems like yeah, I have the wrong move. Yeah, King of Eight is probably because I, actually after King of Eight probably there is no defense. Yeah, yeah? Uh, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, so okay, here you played Knight takes e e five, yeah, or no? You played Bishop takes a h x. Sorry, I've been analyzing this position. Oh, okay, uh -huh. so takes uh, and then the Queen to the d two. So at at this point, it was really critical after Queen to d two. Did you in this position? Uh, calculate knight to g4 or actually it crossed my mind as a last resort but i just missed that in the game white has some basically a knockout mm -hmm. otherwise knight g4 i thought it could survive i thought it was still bad but maybe yeah, it's yeah. Not, so. probably it's yeah maybe not so bad and, and queen to g5 here yeah yeah for g5 yeah for some reason i yeah at least i get yeah i mean because the game is yeah. probably uh, I mean, losing my force, so... Okay, this must be the only way to survive. It's yeah. to survive yes, probably, but okay, after knight to g8, it seemed like all the white pieces are just too active. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, the problem was bishop e6 is the most like logical move here. Mm -hmm. uh, but then queen f4... Exactly, the point is I can take on e6, uh, but then after queen takes e6, even though I'm winning the queen, it's not uh, very clear at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Yeah. But queen f4 instead is, is very strong because okay there is no defense against knight uh, knight g6 yeah, check. The idea is queen b4 or something for black, and then queen takes f7. Queen takes ah f7. yes, very nice. <laughs> we have seen this multi before, like we yeah, this, this was quite nice. Uh, very nice. Wow. And there, okay. there is one other quite nice line if black is queen f6 instead, then rook takes g8. Mm -hmm. Now the queen is undefended, so you cannot take back. You have to go king e7, and then knight c6 check. And then B takes, Queen takes C7 is mate. Oh, wow. Ah, nice. <laughs> so, uh, so many motives in this game. Yeah, so, yeah. that's okay. Nice. Okay. No, but uh, yeah, I mean, in general, I'm attacking with all my pieces. And if, like, for black to be okay, Bishop B6 has to work. Yeah. yeah. Like, if yes. you cannot develop, then okay. That's what makes the queen move work. Yeah, but... yeah. yeah. So in the game, Queen to be before yeah. came, and you found the really strong Rook F3 here. Just yeah, really nice. I mean, it's very accurate. Yeah, yeah, it's very nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, also this uh, team and okay, so uh, uh, f5 it, came, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's on the on the move, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, like what you played, uh, like one completely, did you hear con consider the move rook to g3 also? Or? Yeah, yeah, I was thinking rook g3, I was definitely thinking a lot about. I couldn't yeah. see a clear win after bishop e6, that was my problem. Yes, so, so 97 was my main king f7. And if, for instance, I can take rook takes e6, because it's not possible to take the queen. Mm -hmm. uh, because I go rook e2 check and I win like both rook and. <laughs> but, uh, I didn't know what to do after rook takes e6. I was trying to calculate this and find the clear win here, but I, mm -hmm. I failed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I didn't go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I was okay. very tempted by. Uh, of course, the game is, is winning, but. Uh, yeah. It also felt to me that I could be making five if that was accurate. Yeah. So I, uh, here, the yeah, engine yeah. was here saying queen to e e two was very strong. He was saying here with the point that if you take there is not to be seven. seven check and king f seven. It was another idea. I think. Also yes, also. Actually, I was thinking that okay, some queen takes e one, bishop takes a two, and I wasn't one hundred percent sure. That sure. Was, okay. That was my. Uh, but I'm probably missing some very simple win here. Okay, but I like what you played like wins also. Yeah, so. I did good enough, and it felt. Like after spending 10 15 minutes trying to find the mate and failing, it felt uh, like quite. Uh, I understand, yes, it makes sense. So, check. Yeah. Uh, rook takes here. Uh, yeah, all here was more or, or less force. And here, rook yeah. to g3 check. Yeah. yeah. 
I guess the issue is just that the black piece is exactly like in some possible. with the pieces active, some nine g four exchange down one pawn is not so clear, but with the black pieces so passive, it's yeah. My bishop on d four, maybe maybe I can survive with my king on h five. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe. I but uh, yeah, king h five. Uh, now there should be a different uh, ways. Yeah, with bishop c four. Yeah. Yeah. Remote. Okay, and uh, I mean, uh, yeah, no, exactly. The point is, if bishop takes f two. King takes knight e4, I just take it. Yes. And check first. Oh, yeah, or rook g8. I mean, doesn't matter. I was actually intending bishop. Okay, and like this, yeah? The and point is that I will pin and then, okay. Yes. I mean, I, I have so much time now. King g1, king h2, and then mate, whatever. Yes. <laughs> I mean. King king g3 also, bishop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Many ways. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, but bishop b4 was tricky, actually. It was uh, uh, because rook g6, or, or check first, uh, of course, uh, king h4. Would you see? Uh, now I'm not attacking the knight, so now there is time for f4. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, rook seven is strong. Rook seven is strong, yeah, because I could play like king h2, king h2. but okay. then bishop takes f2. Rook yes. takes f6, bishop g3. And yeah. Next rook takes a4, and already you are a bit active, yeah? <laughs> sure, sure. Calculating because you got king. I still make you maybe. Yeah. But at least it's. It's like uh, yeah, it's there is no less clear. It's much less clear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because yeah, rook e g seven. Uh, yeah, already end. Yes. Ends, uh, ends so h h five and okay, we we thought that you would uh, allow the checkmate. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was very tempted, but then <laughs> at least I tested one. Yeah, yeah, exactly, but. The, the, I was feeling the same that if, the, if it wasn't for Bishop before, you would probably allow it. Yeah. <laughs> Bishop before looks a bit complicated still, exactly. and then time now it's also uh, Bishop before makes. Uh, yeah, for the fans, I wasn't going to resign. I was going to allow checkmate, but Bishop okay. exactly because it's still actually possible to go wrong maybe. Mm -hmm. No, no, uh, H five root takes F six Bishop oh, before. Yeah. Sorry, yes, 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 here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, now, now you play rook takes g4, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah, the easiest way, yeah. Pieces left, yeah. Because the yeah. point is, uh, yeah, I'm taking on g4 and then discover the attack, so I win the rook. Yeah, rook yet to say, like. I right have rook d4, yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. I mean, I can also take on d4, I have three pawns, should be enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah. Okay, continue, okay. like. Uh, no. Yeah, no, oh. the rest we don't need to. No. Okay. But, yeah, yeah. Pawn Congrats on a very nice game, Nils. Seemed a very good uh, attacking chess. Thank you. It's the sort of game that is never as good when you have an engine, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Anyway, yeah. con congrats and best of luck for both of you for the next rounds. Thank yeah, you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. All right. Good to get some uh, insight on the game from the, the players. And um, yeah, thank you for joining, Twitter Um Maybe thank a you bit so much for having me. So. Yeah, yeah, maybe a bit shorter than you anticipated, but uh, it was it was a pleasure indeed. And yes, uh, before we wrap up, I just want to mention um, check out um, um, Mihailo's uh, two accessible courses, which are on sale today. Uh, World Champions uh, Blunder and uh, and uh, let's see um, the initiative in chess a how to guide and and also both of them are on sale today so make sure to check them out to get a good deal and also your uh, recently published uh, course as well Tur uh, what what was the name how to it's called the neutralized the yeah. Catlam. The Catalan Bishop on G2. <laughs> yeah, neutralize the Catalan. So make sure to check that out as well. And uh, yeah, tomorrow we will be joined by international master Tosh Dambar from Norway. And he's also working for the Norwegian Refugee Council. So tomorrow we'll focus a bit on that, I assume. And uh, yeah, it's uh, three and a half, three and a half before the last uh, three games of the match. David Howell with the white pieces tomorrow. Uh, I expect another entertaining and uh, fighting game and uh, we'll be back at uh, three three o'clock CET so uh, make sure to tune in and uh, see you then bye bye yeah, bye